What's up guys and welcome back to Retro Gamer Gen X's Retro Gaming and Computing Channel. Today's video, we're going to be taking a look at the history of video game consoles and handhelds from the 1970s all the way up to the 2000s. Now if you guys are viewers or subscribers of mine, you've probably seen these in my previous history videos shown up above where I did it by decade, the 70s, then the 80s, then the 90s, and then the 2000s. But I decided to wrap everything all up into one video because I was getting questions in the comments like, why did you leave out the 2600? Well, that was a 70s system, not an 80s system, and so on and so forth like that. So just so that people didn't miss the systems that they're trying to look for, I went ahead and made this big video just showing the history of every one of these consoles and handhelds that I've done over the previous year and a half. And really what this is is just a compilation video of all my history videos I've done for the past year and a half and the history sections of my look at videos. And at the beginning of each section of this video, I show a commercial just showing how that system was marketed back in the day. It's kind of funny to see how in the early 70s they were marketing these systems towards adults by the late 70s or so early 80s they started marketing them towards kids and then by the late 80s and then into the early 90s they started marketing to the older generation of gamers like the teenagers and the 20 year olds and then it just started marketing more to adults as these game systems got older up into the 2000s so it's really kind of cool just to see how these systems were marketed back in the day as well also if you're into retro computers i dropped a history video about commodore's two best-selling computers right here on this link if you want to go ahead and check that out as well. Now all these video game systems hold a special place in my heart all the way from the Pong system that I grew up with when I was really young like playing that when I was four years old all the way up from the 2600, the NES, the Sega times with the Sega Genesis, Sega CD and the 32X all the way into the PlayStation era and beyond. Just an amazing journey seeing how this technology has developed through my lifetime. And just to show you guys the history of this multi-billion dollar industry and its beginnings. Now what I've done in this video is obviously I put the links up here for the decades for the 70s, 80s, 90s, and 2000s. So if you wanted to watch it by decade, you can do it up there. But also down below, I put in the chapters each individual system that's in this video. So if you wanted to go ahead and skip ahead and get to your favorite video game system, you can go ahead and do that as well. Although I might suggest watching the entire video from the beginning to the end because it's just an amazing story, like I said, about this multi-billion dollar industry and how it became that way. So without further ado, let's go ahead and take a look at the history of retro video game consoles and handhelds. Magnavox presents Odyssey, the electronic game of the future. Odyssey easily attaches to any brand TV, black and white or color, to create a closed-circuit electronic playground. Odyssey gives you all the exciting action of hockey and 11 other challenging play and learning games for the entire family. Odyssey, a new dimension for your television. Now at your Magnavox dealer. He's listed in the yellow pages. The story of the Magnavox Odyssey starts in the 1950s. Ralph Baer was working for Laurel Electronics, a military contractor. He had been tasked with engineering a new television set. While in the design phase, he thought of adding something extra to the TV. He wanted the customer to not only watch what was being broadcast over the air, but to be able to control games on the TV as well. Laurel passed on the idea, and it was mostly forgotten until the 1960s. In 1966, Baer was working for Sanders Associates another military contractor. While waiting for a bus one day, he remembered the idea he had back in the 50s. He had also seen Tennis for Two back in the late 50s, which was a game created by William Higginbotham at the Brookhaven National Laboratory using the fundamentals of trajectory and wind resistance from military programs to create a tennis game. The next day, he wrote a four-page proposal for a game box that would connect to a TV at a sale price of $25. In the proposal, he said it would tune into a channel just like you do to watch TV. He referred to this channel as LP, or Let's Play. Because Sanders Associates was a military contractor, he chose a small room and picked one of his technicians, Bob Trimley, to work on it and get it ready to present to his bosses at Sanders Associates. By December of 66, they had completed the first design called the TV Game Number 1. 
It had a very simple design in which you could move a vertical line on the screen. He showed this to the director of R&D, Herbert Kampman, which initially didn't want to fund this, but agreed to due to the possible military applications and gave them $2,000 for labor and $500 for materials to develop the project. Bear worked on the project, designed more prototypes, and by February of 67, he assigned another technician, Bill Harrison, the task of building it. During this time, Bear worked with another engineer, Bill Rausch, on making the games for the device. He developed the first games for the system, including a two-player game where the players competed to fill buckets of water, the first button masher. Other games, such as one where two players are dots on the screen and try to chase and tag each other, and another that used a light gun where you had to shoot a dot on the screen controlled by the other player. Bear showed this design to Catman, and he really enjoyed the light gun game. Advised Bear to show the device to senior project management. He showed the device to the board, but most were uninterested in it as it really didn't have any military uses. Despite this, CEO Roden Sanders approved the project to be developed as a commercial product with the aim of either selling it or licensing it. By August of 67, Bear had realized that his goal of $25 per unit would not be obtainable due to the cost of the components. He also was having a hard time developing good games for the system. This is when they brought on Bill Roush again, as he had helped develop the first few games for the system. Roush had made it possible to have another spot on the screen, this one being computer controlled. This was made into a ping pong type game where it had two players that controlled the spots and a computer controlled one, being the ball. Also at this time, they decided to sell the rights to the system as Sanders & Associates was not in the consumer market. This prototype was shown to Teleprompter, a cable TV provider. They were interested in the product, but due to fiscal issues that hit the company, they backed out of the deal. In April of 68, Sanders & Associates also hit some hard times. The project was put on hold after a fifth prototype was created, and mass layoffs came to the company. At this time, Rouse was let go. Work started on the project again, and two more prototypes were made, the seventh being named the Brown Box. It got its name due to the wood grain stickers on the sides of the case. Bear had shown the product to several TV companies to try to get a buyer. Uh, I think we ought to move right on now to the first of our three scenarios, the TV gaming. And uh, hopefully we'll have some fun here. And if you all gather around, uh, we will play a game of ping pong together. Well, here we are, playing ping pong when we ought to be working. Here's our ball, volleying back and forth. Uh, one free ball, plus one net, courtesy of the local CATV station. Here's my partner, Bill, and I, we're going to play ping pong for you in a minute. But before we do, I'd like to show you the controls that we're using, which are part of the plug-in module, the, uh, the uh, ping pong plug-in module, gaming plug-in module of the all-purpose box we talked about earlier. Uh, there is a horizontal knob here, as you can see, which, when I twiddle it, moves my paddle from left to right. There is a vertical control, which moves my paddle up and down. Finally, there's an English knob, which allows me to put curves on the ball, control the vertical position of the ball as it leaves my paddle. Whenever I intercept the ball, if I now miss it, and bat it back at my opponent, I have control over the ball's vertical position, and that's what the English knob is for. And watch me fake him out in a minute. There's another control here, a serve knob, which puts the ball into play, serves it from my side if it's out of play in my, on my position, uh, if it should go out of play. In Bill's position, he's got the same kind of a button right here. He pushes it, and the ball comes in from that side. Ready? It's on your side. It's on my side? <clears throat> okay, let's go. Let me move away from the net a bit. Here we go. A one, a two, a three, and down I go. And up I go, <laughs> and down I go. Now watch me fake him up. I didn't do it. Ah, I did it this time. Okay. Whoops. One, two. Four. You want to score, Bill? Sure. Let's, let's, well, okay, one and nothing. <laughs> Here we go. Up and down. 
end up, he's getting tricky. <laughs> Missed it. One up. Keep it on the table, Bear. Here we go. Fake the out again. Two to one. We'll play up to five. Huh? Good show. Get closer to the net. Make it a little faster. Two up. Two up. Missed it again. Three or two. I guess that makes it count of five. Huh? <coughs> okay, who else would like to play? Why don't you come on and play the game against my hero partner here with Jeff RCA was interested in the product, but an agreement could not be reached and the deal didn't go through. About this time, Bill Enders left RCA for Magnavox. Magnavox had seen the console before, but declined to buy it. Enders convinced them to take another look at it in July of 69. The executives at Magnavox still weren't impressed with the product, but Vice President of Magnavox Console Product Planning, Jerry Martin, by the way, console meaning console TVs, liked the idea and agreed to produce the console. This might be where the origin of the Monkeyer video game console came from. Negotiations went on for a couple years and they finally signed a deal in January of 1971. George Kent and Magnavox turned the prototype into a final product that was sold to consumers. He had designed the case and re-engineered the internal components of the system. To save costs, they took away the color display and made it black and white. They also got rid of all the controllers except for the three dial analog controller. Also instead of using a dial on the console to select games, they came up with the games card that would be inserted into the machine to select the game you wanted to play. They also decided to go with DTL logic instead of ICs to save cost. At the time, ICs were still more expensive than individual components. Magnavox first named the console Skillovision, but by its release it was renamed the Odyssey. The rifle was to be sold as an add-on for the system with the rifle game card Shooting Gallery. They also included board type games to the product to enhance the games themselves. Bear was not a fan of the board game pieces such as the dice, chips, cards, and plastic overlays, but Magnavox now owned the rights and felt this added to the games. With the new additions, it raised the price of the console up to $99 per unit. The console was unveiled during playtests in LA and Grand Rapids, Michigan, and demoed to dealers in Las Vegas in May of 1972. The console was publicly unveiled at the Tavern of Green in New York on May 22, 1972, which Magnavox announced the launch date of September of 72. This was the day that Nolan Bushnell saw the Odyssey and came up with the idea of Pong. The sales would be restricted to just 18 dealers in major metropolitan areas. It was demonstrated for the next few months at dealers until the launch. The Odyssey launched in mid-September of 1972 with an initial order of 50,000 units until manufacturing ramped up. All the consoles would be sold at magnet box dealers. Eventually, between 120 to 140,000 units were produced in 1972, but only 69,000 units were sold. Bear thought this was due to the high price of the unit, but as it turns out, people were confused about the console. Seeing it was only sold at Magnavox dealers, they thought it only worked with Magnavox TVs. Due to low sales, Magnavox thought about discontinuing the product after the holiday season. To help with sales, they lowered the price of the unit to $50 with the purchase of a TV. Also, more games were made, and the light gun add-on game was sold as well. The unit started to be sold worldwide in 1973 and sales started to pick up. In late 1973, Magnavox started a large advertising campaign for the upcoming holiday season. As demand rose, they produced more consoles. By 1974, it appeared in the Sears Wish Book for sale. 1974 was the best year for sales, selling more than 129,000 units. Then in 1974, Magnavox signed a deal with Texas Instruments to use their ICs and a newly designed, cost-reduced console that would become the Odyssey dedicated console series, such as the Odyssey 100 and 200. The Magnavox Odyssey was discontinued in 1975 to make way for the newer Odyssey series of consoles. It had a three-year lifespan from 1972 to 1975, selling more than 350,000 units in total and being the world's first video game console. I'm sure when you went out last week to play Pong, you got to so much fun, you just planned for that to come home. We all miss you, Doreen. But guess what? Atari, inventors of them electronic games put the quarters in, just made Pong for home tables. Score keeping and all. 
song invented by Atari. Now at last you can play at home. Don't win, darling. Come on back home. The story of the Pong console really starts way back in the 1950s. 1958, to be exact, when physicist William Higginbotham designed Tennis for Two, which was a computer game based on the game of tennis. Two players would go head to head with the ball that would bounce back and forth. So really, this was the first Pong type game that was developed. And this was way back in the 1950s. This deserves a video all on its own. But let's fast forward a few years. In 1966, another engineer named Ralph Baer worked for a company called Sanders and Associates. It's now called BA Systems and is a military contractor. Bear came up with the idea to play games on a television set and he thought it would be a marketable idea. And Sanders and Associates greenlighted the idea. At about the same time, three different young engineers were hopping onto the scene. One named Nolan Bushnell that recently graduated from the University of Utah's College of Electrical Engineering. He is one of the few students that got to play around on the digital computer mainframe and got to play the original Space War video game. He had to work his way through college and worked at the Lagoon Amusement Park in Utah. There he saw electromechanical machines, specifically Chicago Coins Speedway Racing Game, and it inspired him to want to create his own arcade games. Also at this time, a young engineer named Ted Danby had just gotten out the military. He had learned a ton of electrical experience while enlisted, and his first civilian job was with Bank of America to work on electrical mechanical accounting machines. Then he was hired on by Hewlett Packard, but didn't stay there too long. Within a few weeks, he moved on to Ampex. This was in 1961. Nolan Bushnell eventually got hired on with Ampex as well. And in 1971, Ampex hired another young engineer named Alan Alcorn, who recently graduated from the University of California, Berkeley. Bushnell and Danby formed a company called Syzygy and developed a clone system of the video game Space War that they had played on the deck mainframe in college. The prototype was developed by Danby and Bushnell did the marketing, trying to find somebody that could manufacture it for them. They found Nutting & Associates, which was the maker of coin-op trivia games and shooting games, and decided to go with them. They fabricated the fiberglass cabinet and inserted a coin mech and the electronics. Although sales exceeded $3 million, it was still considered a commercial failure. It was at this point that Danby and Bushnell decided to rename the company due to trademark issues because Syzygy was already taken by another company. So they decided to name the company Atari. The name comes from the ancient Japanese board game named Go. And Atari is when you hit a target in a game. In 1971, they hired Alcorn from Ampex as well. Bushnell assigned Alcorn a task to create a new video game something that Atari would distribute themselves without a third-party distributor. Bushnell really wanted a racing game to be created, but instead he wanted Alcorn's first project to be easy on him. Bushnell went to a trade show in New York and saw the Magnavox Odyssey that Bear had developed with Magnavox. Magnavox showed off the system while they were still waiting on the patent to go through. This is supposedly where Bushnell came up with the idea of Pong. He put Al Alcorn in charge of developing this new video game, after Alcorn developed the circuitry, he bought a Hitachi black and white television and put it into a cabinet they hand built and wired it all together. They put the prototype into Andy Capp's Tavern in Sunnyvale, California in August of 1972. And within a week and a half, the owner of the tavern called and said that the game was having problems and wasn't working anymore. They came down expecting the circuitry or something to be broke. But the problem was, it was just jam-packed full of quarters, and Atari knew they had a success on their hands. It was at this point that Bushnell wanted to develop a system into a home video game console. This is when Atari hired engineer Harold Lee to work with Al Alcorn. They took Alcorn's design and integrated it into an IC, basically making a Pong on a chip that minimalized the circuitry and really brought the cost down to the consumer. At the time of its release, Atari's Pong on a chip was the highest performing chip used in a consumer product. Now Atari had developed a system, but they needed to find a distributor. Atari had seen that the Magnavox Odyssey had an ad in the Sears catalog, so Atari approached Sears' top executive, Tom Quinn, who really wanted the product, but Atari believing they could get a better deal elsewhere, declined. 
Atari showed the console off in January of 75 at a toy fair trying to find a distributor, but this turned out to be unsuccessful. So Atari met back up with Sears and Quinn. They struck a deal that by Christmas season, Atari had to come up with 150,000 units. Although Atari didn't have the capability to produce that many units, Bushnell was able to secure funding through venture capitalist Don Valentine to build a new factory to fulfill Sears' order. Their first units were branded Sears Telegames to fulfill the contract, then Atari products were made. Now, do you think that this would be the beginning of a great story for Atari? But at this point, in April 1974, Magnavox filed a lawsuit against Atari, along with other manufacturers of Pong clone systems. Bear and Magnavox were saying that Atari had infringed on their trademark, which had finally went through in 1973. In fact, in court, Bushnell did not deny that he had saw the Odyssey and stated, The fact is, I absolutely did see the Odyssey game, and I did not think that it was very clever. Atari settled out of court for an approximate payment of $1.5 million made payable in eight installments, and Magnavox obtained the rights to see full information on Atari's products publicly announced over the next year. And if history serves me correct, this is why the VCS was pushed back an additional few months before it was released, so Magnavox wouldn't get any information on it. Atari went on to sell more iterations of a Pong console, including Pong Doubles, Super Pong, and later consoles like Video Pinball. But the original Pong console that debuted in 1975 sold a little over 150,000 units. It was completely discontinued by 1978 and was the Kickstarter for Atari Incorporated. You're watching the most exciting game you will ever see on your TV set. Telstar by Coleco, with three different games. Telstar Tennis, with digital scoring, variable speeds. Telstar Hockey, each player controls a goalie plus a forward on the other side. Oops, a goal. And Telstar Singles Handball, a game you play yourself. Telstar Handball, Tennis, Hockey, all three at an exciting low price. For great family fun, hitch your TV to a Telstar by Coleco. The story of Coleco really starts in 1932. This is when Maurice Greenberg opened the Connecticut Leather Company. They started producing leather goods and leather shoe repair kits. During World War II, the demand for business grew, and so did the company. In early 1950s, Maurice Greenberg's son, Leonard Greenberg, joined the company. It was his idea to sell leather lacing and leather craft kits to children at a 1954 toy fair. Their leather moccasins kit was chosen as the Child Guidance Prestige Toy, and it was at this point the Connecticut Leather Company that decided to go full on with kids' toys. In 1956, Leonard Greenberg bought a technology used to vacuum form plastic, which led the company to develop several small toys made out of plastic, including wading pools. In 1961, the leather and shoe finding portion of the business was sold off, and the Connecticut Leather Company abbreviated its name to Coleco. In 1963, Coleco acquired Castrell Corporation, which was a leading manufacturer of vinyl pools and toys. After this acquisition, Coleco became the largest manufacturer of above-ground swimming pools in the world. In 1966, the company had grown so large that Leonard persuaded his brother Arnold Greensburg to join. After Arnold joined, several other toy manufacturing companies were acquired by Coleco. Coleco enjoyed success during the late 1960s in the toy manufacturing sector. In 1971, Coleco became public on the New York Stock Exchange and then acquired a snowmobile company. After the acquisition of the snowmobile company, sales were very poor in that sector. Coleco had to find a way to make money and make money fast. Right around this time, Arnold Greensburg was named CEO of the company and wanted to get into the growing video game market. Coleco in 1976 started producing the Telstar dedicated game consoles. Nearly all these dedicated systems were built around a general instrument's Pong on a chip which there was a shortage of at the time. But since Coleco was one of the first to order, they got their entire shipment while other companies didn't. This made Coleco a leader in the dedicated game console market in the 1970s. The sales of the dedicated game consoles allowed Coleco to break even with the failing snowmobile business. Coleco was so successful with the Telstar units, they almost sold a million consoles. This put them in second place for the most consoles sold in the first generation. 
and a left. The one with all the fun. The Fairchild Video Entertainment System at your larger JCPenney. The home entertainment system that never gets old. Plug in a new video cart and change the fun. Play tic-tac-toe, shooting gallery, or just doodle. Switch video carts and play Desert Fox. Switch again, it's Blackjack. Or play the two built-in games, Pro Hockey or Tennis Champ. Channel F for fun. The Fairchild Video Entertainment System. Just $169.95. Video cart cartridges, $19.95 each. At your larger JCPenney. The story of the Channel F starts in the mid-1960s. An engineer named Norman Alpert was working at AMF, the maker of bowling alley equipment, in their R&D division. In fact, he was one of the ones responsible for creating the automated scoring that you have in bowling alleys nowadays. Alpert worked at AMF throughout the 1960s. In 1969, AMF moved its R&D division from Connecticut to North Carolina, and a few engineers didn't want to make the move, and Alpert was one of them. He then created his own company named Alpex Computer Corporation. When Alpex first started, their business plan originated around cash registers and had a partnership with Pitney Bowes. But because of the competition with IBM and NCR, their partnership ended in 1973. At this point, Alpex had no products and had to lay off most of its workforce except for three engineers, all of them being former AMF employees. Alpex knew it had to do something to stay alive. They wanted to get into the emerging video game market and saw this as being a potentially profitable market as well. With the success of the Atari Pong arcade machine and the Magnavox Odyssey home console, the time just seemed right. It was also around this time that Intel had started to produce their CPUs. First, the 4004, then the 8008, and lastly, the 8080 in 1974. Of the remaining engineers at Alpex, Wallace Kirshner saw the new CPU as an opportunity to run complex software on a microcomputer, giving it the capability to produce bitmap graphics. The Magnavox Odyssey used old outdated technology called DTL, or Diode to Transistor Logic, and the Pong Arcade used TTL, or Transistor to Transistor Logic. These types of discrete logic were able to generate gameplay on the screen, but with very rudimentary graphics. Kirshner met with Albert and was given the go-ahead to start developing a video game system. Kirshner knew the system had to have good games, so they hired a software engineer named Lawrence Haskell, another former AMF employee. Kirshner would be in charge of the hardware and Haskell of the software. The two started on a project codenamed Raven, short for Remote Access Video Entertainment. The first iteration of the prototype would use the Intel 8008 but by its release in 1974, they switched over to the new Intel 8080 CPU. By using a CPU, they can now run software on it and be able to have different games that the user could switch out, but they had to come up with a way that this could be done. They looked into all different media types that they had at the time, paper tape, magnetic tape, or magnetic discs. All of these types of media were impractical due to their complexity and cost, but there was a new way to run software on a computer programmable EEPROMs, which were actually part of Intel's 8080 dev kit. Once programmed, they were to be soldered or socketed onto the board to run the software, but that still wouldn't be practical for the consumer. Haskell and Kirshner took a trip to Radio Shack. They picked up a few small project boxes, perf board, and a few edge connectors. With these parts in hand, they created the first prototype video game cartridge by soldering the EEPROM onto the perf board, putting the project box around it, and then inserting it into the edge connector on the main board. The video game cartridge was born. With Raven's hardware almost complete, Haskell was finishing up a few games that he was designing. Tennis, which was pretty much a Pong clone. Hockey, which was like Pong, but you could move your player around the screen and control the angle of the player, move the goalie, and it had an on-screen score and time. These eventually became the built-in games on the Channel F. Three more games were created at this time, Tic-Tac-Toe, Shooting Gallery, and Doodle. They made it onto the first cartridge for the Channel F. With the design phase being complete, Haskell and Kirshner demoed the Raven to Alpert and the Alpex Board of Directors. They liked the product, but did not have the capital to manufacture or market the game system. They needed to find a business partner. Just as Ralph Baer did with his brown box, they demoed the system to several TV companies such as Sylvania, Zenith, RCA, and Motorola. But none of these companies were interested in their toy. By 1975, Alpex knew they had to get the product out before the competition did. 
Atari had just released their Pong home console. It integrated the TTL logic into one chip. Atari was getting closer to what Alpex was doing now. Alpex then started showing the Raven prototype to semiconductor companies. A company named Fairchild, which was a camera company, but also produced semiconductors, had supplied Alpex back in the day when they were making cash registers with their components. This relationship paid off. Alpex showed the Raven prototype to Fairchild's Sean Fogarty. He liked the product so much, it went straight to the CEO, Wilf Corrigan. He saw this product as the next step into their integrated circuit division. Fairchild then sent engineer Jerry Lawson out to see the Raven. He gave it the final approval and Fairchild bought the system. Since Fairchild wanted to use their own silicone, Lawson worked with Haskell and Kirshner and converted the system from the Intel 8080 CPU to Fairchild's own F8 CPU. At this point, Fairchild took over the project and assigned Lawson as project lead. They had to design a case, a cartridge slot mechanism, cartridge, and controllers for the system. At this point, the code name was changed from Raven to Stratos. Lawson hired industrial designer Nicholas Telfor to design the console case, controllers, and cartridge design, which got its design inspiration from the 8-track tape. Telsford then hired on Ron Smith, a mechanical engineer, to complete the design for the cartridge mechanism. Then they hired graphic artist Tom Kamafuji to draw the cartridge artwork. With everything complete, the system was debuted at the July 1976 CES show. However, only an empty shell was displayed and did not get too much attention from the crowd. They changed the name of the system again from the Stratos to the Video Entertainment System or VES. A couple months later, the system was featured in a July 1976 article in Business Week called The Smart Machine Revolution. It showed the Channel F alongside of cars, watches, and other electronics that used a microprocessor. This got the attention of the consumer and interest peaked. A video game system that played more than just the built-in games with a microprocessor powering it, the first of its kind. Just before its launch, the name of the system was changed again to the Channel F, short for Channel Fun. It launched in November of 1976 in North America and October of 77 in Japan. 350,000 units were made. It had three cartridges at launch time. Video Cart 1, which had Tic-Tac-Toe, Shooting Gallery, Doodle, and Quadradoodle. Video Cart 2, with Desert Fox and Shooting Gallery. And Video Cart 3, with Video Blackjack. Initial sales of the system were okay for the time. Not strong, but solid. Then the Atari VCS was launched in September of 1977. With Atari's fast-paced, action pack and licensed arcade ports, the Channel F sales dwindled down. Fairchild needed a way to cut production costs and make improvements to the system to stay competitive. Lawson and Telsforce started work on an updated Channel F2. The upgraded design would be smaller, integrated most of the remaining logic on the motherboard, have a redesigned case, detachable controllers, and have audio coming through the RF signal instead of the internal speaker. By 1979, sales of the system plummeted. With the added competition of the Odyssey 2, the Intellivision, and the Astrocade, Fairchild started to look for a buyer for the Channel F. A company named Zarkon International made a deal with Fairchild and bought the rights to the Channel F. Zircon released the upgraded system as the Channel F2 after the acquisition. Not long after this, Jerry Lawson left the company and formed his own game company named Videosoft, which made games for the Amiga, CBS, Mattel, Milton Bradley, and Parker Brothers. By late 1979 and early 1980, Zircon wanted to expand to Europe. To do this, they licensed the Channel F2 to several companies in different countries in Europe, creating the Channel 2F clone systems, such as the Lexor Video Entertainment System in Sweden, Adamant Grandstand Video Entertainment Computer in the UK, the Saba Video Play, and the Normandy Color Teleplay from Germany. The system really didn't catch on in Europe either due to Atari's dominance. By 1982, the technology used in the system was dated, with added competition from higher powered systems such as ColecoVision and the Atari 5200. The Channel F was really showing its age, and sales showed this. In 1983, Zircon discontinued the Channel F2. In total, there were 26 cartridges made for the system from 1976 to 1981, with no games being made in 1982 or 83. All of the games were developed in-house with no third-party developers. The Channel F had a seven-year lifespan from 1976 to 1983. 
It sold its initial 350,000 units made by Fairchild, but sales figures are scarce for Zircon and other licensed manufacturing companies in Europe, so we'll say for argument's sake it sold over 350,000 units, and was the first video game system to use programmable ROM cartridges. The story of Nintendo as we know it started in Kyoto, Japan in 1889. That's right, 1889. Japanese entrepreneur Fizuhiro Yamamuchi started a company named Nintendo Karuta to produce and distribute playing cards. This was a tough business to get into at the time due to a Japanese law that was implemented in 1882 to ban gambling because of organized crime. With this ban, most playing cards were banned as well, and most companies abandoned the playing card business altogether because they didn't want to be associated with criminals. However, one type of card was still being allowed, Hanafuda, or flower cards. This made Nintendo the sole producer of these types of playing cards. At first, they made high quality cards using expensive manufacturing processes, but later they made cheaper and more cost efficient cards, making the business very lucrative. It wasn't until 1907 that they started making western style playing cards like we use today. They entered an agreement with another Japanese company, Naihoi Senbai, or better known as Japan Tobacco, to sell the cards at their cigarette stores. It was also at this time the company changed its name to Mario Fuku Nintendo Card Company. A few years later in 1915, the name was changed again to Yamamuchi Nintendo, but still used the Mario Fuku Nintendo Card Company brand on their cards. Nintendo continued to produce cards through the 1920s. In 1929, Yuzuhiro departed the company. Due to Japanese culture, he would have to leave the company to his male child, but he did not have one. Instead, he adopted his son-in-law, Sikiroyo Kendia, and passed the company on to him. By this time, Nintendo was the largest and most successful playing card company in Japan. Sikiroyo took on the surname of Yamamuchi. In 1933, Sergei Royo created a general partnership and changed the name once again to Yamamuchi Nintendo Company Limited and constructed a new company headquarters right next to the old one in Kyoto. During this time, Sergei Royo was thinking of the future and who would head the company after him, as he did not have any male children either. His plans were to adopt his son-in-law just as he had been but he had left his family and the company for unknown reasons. So Sakiyoro made his grandson, Hiroshi Yamamuchi, heir to the company when he decided to retire. Then came World War II, which brought a great financial burden onto the company as people were more concentrated on the war effort than playing games. During this time, Hiroshi's wife, Michiku, which came from a wealthy family, supported the business and kept it going. After the war, things did get better, as American soldiers came to Japan and were buying and using Nintendo's playing cards. In 1947, Sikiroyo founded a distribution company for the playing cards called Marifuku Company Limited. This is the company that directly turned into the company we all know today as Nintendo Company Limited. In 1949, Sikiroyo had a devastating stroke, which eventually took his life, and Hiroshi became the third and longest lasting president of Nintendo. In 1959, Nintendo formed a partnership with Disney to produce playing cards with Disney characters printed on them, bringing Nintendo into the children's market. Also in this year, they moved their company headquarters to a different part of Kyoto. In 1962, Nintendo became a publicly traded company on the Kyoto Stock Exchange. A year later, in 1963, they changed their name for the last time to what we all know Nintendo Company Limited, and started manufacturing games as well. 
But by 1964, after the Tokyo Olympics, Japanese people really started getting into Western culture. They started to go out to arcades, bowling alleys, and other places instead of staying at home and playing games. Sales started to slump, and by the end of 1964, Nintendo's stock fell to just 60 yen per share. In 1965, Nintendo hired Gunpai Yokoi for his expertise in manufacturing and assembly line production of electronic devices. With this experience, Yamamuchi put him in charge of the games division. They restructured the company to be more related to games, but still kept the division for playing cards. That division later evolved into making Pokemon cards. This is when Nintendo started producing classic board games like chess, Mahjong, Shoji, and the game that inspired Atari's name, Go. In 1970, Nintendo developed its first electronic toy, the Beam Gun. This was designed by Masuki Yorama. It was a light gun that worked with sensors in the targets, and when hit, popped up to show that it was hit. Over one million of these units were sold, Nintendo's first successful electronic toy. So successful, in fact, Nintendo partnered with Magnavox to create the light gun used on the very first game console, the Magnavox Odyssey, in 1971. In the early 1970s, Nintendo found success in their games and toys division, but this ended with the 1973 oil crisis. The cost of producing plastic skyrocketed. This took a toll on production costs at Nintendo, losing billions of yen. Nintendo knew they had to do something. They saw the success Magnavox was having with the Odyssey and made a licensing agreement to use their technology to create their own Pong-type console. The Color TV Game 6 launched in 1977 in Japan, being Nintendo's first video game console as well. This became a series of games such as the Color TV 15, Color TV Game 112, Computer TV Game, and Color TV Game Block Breaker. These went on to be the most successful first-gen consoles, selling more than 3 million units, outselling Atari, Magnavox, and Coleco all together. With the success of the Color TV series, Nintendo was looking ahead, investing that money into future projects such as the Game & Watch and development of their first programmable ROM cartridge video game system, the Famicom. In fact, the Color TV continued on until 1983. Sales from it and the Game & Watch, which released in 1980, fully funded the R&D for the Famicom that was released in 1983. Out here we entertain ourselves at home. So we got an Atari video game. There's so many different games to play. We especially like Space Invaders, zapping those little devils from outer space. It's fun, but personally I think the whole idea of creatures from outer space is a little far-fetched. No other company offers you as many different video game cartridges as Atari. The story of the Atari 2600 really starts in 1972, when Nolan Bushnell and Ted Danby formed Atari Incorporated. During this time, Atari produced arcade game hits like Pong, but by 1974, Atari had realized they needed to get into the home video game market. At this point, Atari acquired Cyan Engineering, and with that acquisition, brought on engineers Ron Milner and Steve Mayer. Also in 1975, after the acquisition of Cyan Engineering, the two engineers Mayer and Milner met with Moss Technology that was recently purchased by Commodore Incorporated. They spoke with Chuck Peddle, and he advised them that Moss could sell them the 6502 microprocessor for a price of $25 per unit. Unfortunately for Atari, this price was still too high for the consumer market. At this point, Mayer, Milner, and Peddle all sat down and came up with the design of the 6507 processor for Atari's use. This was a cost-reduced version of the processor, which had less address lines, a smaller footprint, and a smaller cost. Moss offered the chip to Atari for a price of $12 per unit. Also with the deal would be bundled in, for the additional $12 per unit, the Moss Riot chip, the RAM input-output timer chip. Atari struck the deal, and the development of the 2600 started in late 1975. Atari hired Joe DeCour to help design the graphics chip for the new game console. The first prototype, which was named Stella, 
had the 6507 processor, the Riot chip, and a breadboard version of the graphics chip known as Stella at the time, which would eventually become the television interface adapter. Now a second version of this prototype was completed by March 1976 with the help of Miner. They actually incorporated the chip called the Television Interface Adapter, or TIA chip, into the design in 1976. Unfortunately, Atari was experiencing financial woes. By this point, due to the development of the Atari 2600, or the VCS system, its Pong console, and its arcade divisions, Atari was millions of dollars in debt at the time, and needed financial help at this point. Bushnell agreed to the terms for Warner Communications to purchase Atari Incorporated. On June 4, 1977, the Atari VCS was debuted at the Consumer Electronics Show and by September of 1977, the Atari VCS was launched at a price of $199. By 1978, Bushnell and Warner Communications were in disagreements about how the Atari 2600 should be marketed. Nolan Bushnell at this point decided to step away from Atari. Between 1978 and 1983, Warner Communications had great success with the Atari 2600 system. Unfortunately, by 1983, due to really poor games being dumped on the video game market, the video game crash occurred. At this point, Warner was losing money, and Atari decided to sell. In 1984, Atari was sold to ex-Commodore founder Jack Trammell. During Jack's reign at Atari, we saw the last iteration of the Atari 2600, the Atari 2600 Jr. released in 1986. This was produced until 1992, giving Atari an amazing 15-year run. Astrocade, the professional video game system that gives you four-player capability, three built-in games, a calculator, and these new cartridges, Creative Crayon. Even the young can make beautiful pictures. The Incredible Wizard has a dungeon of surprises for you. You can even create your own games with Astrocade Basic, the easy computer teaching cartridge. Astrocade, the home entertainment sensation that's a personal computer too. The story of the Bally Astrocade starts in 1969. Bally acquired Midway Manufacturing, an amusement game company, and consolidated it into a company called Midway Bally. By the mid-1970s, Midway Bally wanted to get into the home video game market. They contacted Dave Nutting & Associates, an industrial design engineering firm, to design a video chip that could be used in all their planned future systems, arcade, home computer, and game consoles. Nutting created a chipset that would be used in the arcade games Gorf and Wizard of War. It provided a 320 by 204 screen resolution with four colors per scan line. At the time, this was considered high resolution. The only downfall was the chipset used memory that was accessed faster than the normal 2 MHz dynamic RAM of the time. Having page mode addressing to write to the buffer inside the video chip to increase draw and redraw rates and to maintain a higher screen resolution. They wanted to use the same technology in a home game console, but to keep cost downs, they did not use the page addressing like in the arcade. Instead, the screen resolution was capped off at 160 by 102 with four colors of a possible 256 per scan line. The video chip didn't support sprites, so it was purely bitmap, which was notoriously slow to draw and redraw to the screen. To pull this off, they used a blitter type system that through software was able to produce sprite-like objects. The controllers were designed with the pistol grip with the button being the trigger. There was a small thumb eight-way joystick that was placed on top that was also a paddle control and could be turned as well. The case was designed with the 70s era wood grain on the side. On the front, there was a 24-key keyboard that was used to select games and for other input features. There was also a reset and eject button on the front of the cartridge slot. The power button for the system was located in the back. By 1977, they named the system the Bally Home Library Computer. It was offered for pre-order through mail order and was supposed to be released by the Christmas season. But due to delays in production, the launch didn't happen until April of 1978 and the system's name changed again to the Bally Professional Arcade. The system was barely marketed. It was not advertised like Atari or other game systems of the time and was really only sold in computer stores or by mail order. By 1979, Bally Midway decided to sell off their consumer products division which included the game console. They found a buyer in Astrovision Incorporated, 
a company that had been trying to release their own video game console but had failed up to that point. In 1981, they renamed the system once again to the Bally Computer System and included a basic cartridge with it. Back when Bally Midway owned it, they were developing an expansion unit for the system called the Z-Grass to turn it into a full-fledged computer. With a full keyboard, 32K of RAM, and a 32K ROM with the GRASS programming language built in and I.O. ports to connect to storage media such as floppy or tape drive, and was compatible with CPM. Very few examples of this device exist today. In 1982, the name was changed a final time to the Astrocade. By 1983, the effect of the video game crash was starting to hit the game market. Astrovision Incorporated saw the signs and discontinued the system. By 1985, the Astrocade and its software could no longer be found. In all, there were 28 games, all of which were made in-house with no third-party developers. The Bally Astrocade had a five-year lifespan from 1978 until 1983. Sales numbers are almost non-existent, but the few articles I've read said that the system sold around 150,000 units. I don't know how accurate that is, but I'm assuming it's close due to its poor marketing. This was Midway's only venture into the console market. After this, they became a third-party developer for other console makers, making great titles such as Mortal Kombat. Simon sets the pace. You follow right along. Light the lights that Simon lights, or he'll tell you that you're wrong. Simon's a computer. Simon has a brain. To either do what Simon says, or else go down the drain. Simon is a master. He tells you what to do. But you can master Simon if you follow every clue. And if you think Simon's fun at the party, wait till you play it alone. Simon with five ways to play from MB Electronics. The story of Simon starts in 1976 when engineers Ralph Baer, the father of video games and the designer of the Magnavox Odyssey, and Howard Morrison were at the Music Operators of America trade show in 1976. There they saw Atari's Touch Me arcade game that was released in 1974. Touch Me was a game of copying patterns the computer was generating on a button panel. It had four colored buttons that would start lighting up starting with one and adding one more color to the sequence each time the player got it right, also adding to their score. It would continue until the player got the sequence wrong and the game would end. It was made to compete with the pinball machines of the time, as it did not have a screen and joysticks like a majority of the arcade games that were coming out. This game was not a success for Atari, but did sell a few units. Baron Morrison saw this machine and thought the idea was good, but thought the execution of the game was horrible. In fact, Bear was quoted as saying, Nice gameplay, terrible execution, visibly boring, miserable, rasping sounds. It was at this time that they thought that they could come up with a consumer product, a portable version of this game, made smaller and better than what Atari was offering in the arcades. By 1977, Bear had created a prototype of the game using the Texas Instruments TMS-1000 microcontroller and named it Follow Me. One of Bear's associates, Lenny Cope, programmed the source code for the microcontroller. They made the game so small that it fit into an 8 inch by 8 inch console. It was pitched to Milton Bradley and they agreed to distribute it. It first debuted in 1978, get this, at Studio 54. You know the infamous celebrity party palace in New York in the 70s and 80s and was a massive hit there with the patrons. After the successful outing at Studio 54, Milton Bradley started distributing it to consumer stores. Debuting at a price of $24.95, it was a huge hit during the 1978 Christmas shopping season. It was so successful that in the following couple years, two new Simon games were released. Pocket Simon, an even smaller version of the game that could fit in most pockets. Also Super Simon was released, giving it more games to play and introducing multiple players for head-to-head -head competition. Milton Bradley was acquired by Hasbro in 1984 and continued to produce Simon. The original Simon is still being produced to this day as Simon Classic. Other versions of Simon, such as the redesigned Super Simon, Simon Sticks, Simon Squared, Simon Trickster, Simon Flash, and Simon Swipe have been made. So unlike most of the consoles, computers, or games that I have taken a look at, Simon has them all beat. 
Being released in 1978 and still in production today, in the year 2023, gives Simon an unbeatable 45-year run, and still going strong for a new generation of kids to love, just as we did. Odyssey, video game fun, computer keyboard challenge, the entrance to an alternate world of fire-breathing dragons, hard-hitting sluggers, arcade wizards, outer space wizards. More than 40 games in all, Odyssey, the excitement of a game, the mind of a computer, all for the price of an ordinary video game, Odyssey. The story of the Odyssey 2 starts in 1975. It was during this year that Magnavox decided to discontinue the world's very first video game console, the Magnavox Odyssey. They decided to make dedicated consoles like Atari's Pong with cost-reduced integrated circuits. These were the Odyssey series of dedicated consoles such as the Magnavox Odyssey 100 and 200. Also in 1975, Magnavox was bought by Philips and became a subsidiary of Philips. In 1976, Fairchild released the Channel F and in 1977, Atari released the VCS or later known as the 2600. Both of these systems used a new technology to the gaming industry, replaceable programmable cartridges. Meaning the system didn't just play one game, but it could play multiple games stored on individual game carts. In January of 1977, Magnavox president Alfred D. Scipio said in a January 17, 1977 Business Week article that the company would have a new microprocessor-based video game console on the market in 1977. He saw what Fairchild was doing with the Channel F and heard leaks about Atari's new console on the horizon, both of which used programmable cartridges to provide games for the consoles. He saw this as the future of video game consoles and wanted in on the market. Development of the new console was slow. They had decided to go with an Intel-powered machine, but needed help with its development. By July of 1977, things were not going well. So bad, in fact, they needed to call for some assistance. It was at this time that John Helms, lead engineer for Magnavox's video game division, contacted Sanders & Associates. He spoke with Ralph Baer, who designed the first Odyssey game system for Magnavox. By late July, Baer had sent a letter to Helms suggesting a collaboration for the new console and the amount that it would cost Magnavox. By August, a prototype was completed, but because it was taking so long and costs were increasing, Magnavox was talking about canceling the project altogether. Helms was so worried about the project being canceled, he called Bear and asked him to come to the Odyssey Engineering headquarters to see the new console and get his thoughts about it. Bear obliged and spent the whole day at the headquarters. They showed him the prototype, schematics, and system specs. Bear really liked the idea of the keyboard and the possibility to turn the system into a full-fledged computer. He also attended a meeting about canceling the Odyssey 2 project. He spoke with Magnavox and Intel execs, and by mid-September, the project was saved and continued on. Bear quoted in his book, Video Games in the Beginning, as saying, Almost sure I saved the program. By the end of September, Magnavox wanted Bear and Sanders and Associates to help with development of games. By December, Magnavox wanted Sanders to create a game or two for the system. Bear also met with Magnavox Games Chief, Mike Satup. They wanted Sanders to work with the programming staff at Magnavox, which consisted of three people, one of which was Sam Overton, to help with the development of good games. Scipio is quoted as saying in a December 26 Business Week article, There is no sound evidence yet that a large unit market is there at the price points these products require stating that it was not a failure on Magnavox that the console was not ready for the Christmas season of 1977. In late January of 1978, Bear requested all documentation on the new system to help make proposals for their work to be done. Also at this time, Overton says six games are done, but he is the only programmer left. Overton is made a coordinator between Sanders and Magnavox, as Sanders offers to take on the programming for the new system. At this point, Intel's Ed Averett started to develop the games. In fact, Averett made most of the games for the system. Bear started development of a pinball game for the system that users could create their own pinball playfield to play on. The project ended up costing Magnavox $50,000 and the game was never released. Now, this is where the details of the Odyssey 2 story get a little hazy. 
There are reports that the system launched in September of 1978 in the USA in limited quantities and with a different logo as the trademark for the logo we all know wasn't approved yet. However, I cannot confirm this information with other sources. It also is said to have been released in Europe as the Philips Video Pack G7000 in December of 1978. The system was actually more popular in Europe, but the release was eventually halted due to a defect in the power plug causing shorts. Approval for the Odyssey 2 trademarks had gone through as of February of 1979. This is when the system is thought to have been officially launched with its updated logos and verbiage. But for the sake of argument, I will say that the system launched in September of 1978 in the US and December of 78 in Europe. The Odyssey 2 was shown at the Winter CES show in January of 1979 to positive reviews. People liked the system and were impressed with the built-in keyboard. By this time, the Odyssey 2 was looking like it would be a success for Magnavox. However, bad omens were starting to arise. In July of 1980, Averett demoed a game to the heads of Magnavox. It was a game much like the popular Pac-Man. It did not have a title at the time, but it would soon be called Casey Munchkin. By August of 1980, the game was approved by Magnavox to be put into production and was released in mid-1981. This was the beginning of the end for the Odyssey 2. In November, a Chicago retailer named Minnesota Fats, the Video King, ran an ad about the Odyssey 2 and its new game, KC Munchkin, and that it is a Pac-Man type game. This got the attention of Atari, who had a deal with Namco and Midway to be the sole distributor of Pac-Man at the time. An Atari legal secretary was sent to another Chicago retailer to buy the game and was told by a store rep the game was just like Pac-Man. Then Atari sent investigators out to Minnesota Fat Store to buy the game, only to hear the same line, it's just like Pac-Man. At this point, Atari and Midway had enough and filed a copyright infringement suit against Magnavox, stating Casey Munchkin infringes on Pac-Man's copyright. In December of 1981, a decision was reached in the case and it was found that Casey Munchkin was not substantially similar to Pac-Man and did not infringe on his copyright. Atari was quick to appeal. In January of 1982, Atari argued its case before the United States Court of Appeals, 7th Circuit. The trial went until March, where the decision was reversed and they stated Casey Munchkin was substantially similar to Pac-Man and it was soon pulled off the shelves. In September of 1982, it was announced that the Odyssey 2 would be imported by Corton Trading Company and marketed by Kawanda Company and Tuscana Company for release in Japan. Later that month, it was released, also being later released in Brazil. It was around this time that a new console, the Odyssey 3, was starting to be developed. This system was released by Philips in Europe in a very limited run, under the name Videopack Plus or the G7400. It really was just an enhanced version of the Odyssey 2. It had a Microsoft Basic computer module add-on made for it that would not work with the original Odyssey 2 or Video Pack. Now speaking of add-ons, the Odyssey 2 had two additional add-ons. The Voice, which was a digital voice synthesizer somewhat like the IntelliVoice for the Intellivision, and the Chess module. This was used with the chess game, and it was necessary because the Odyssey 2 did not have enough memory or CPU power to make it a competitive game of chess without it. It gave the Odyssey 2 a second CPU and more RAM to be able to play the chess game. But as we all know, 1983 was the year of the video game crash, and it took a huge chunk out of every video game manufacturer's pockets. Magnavox was no different. With the cost of Atari's lawsuit, and the sales of the system and games plummeting, Magnavox was seeing huge losses. By June of 1983, they announced that Odyssey 3 was put on an indefinite hold, and by March of 1984, the Odyssey 2 had been discontinued, with Magnavox Gaming and Odyssey Division being dissolved, bringing it into Magnavox being a video game console manufacturer lasting 12 years in the market, the longest of any company to that point. The Odyssey 2 had a six-year lifespan from 1978 to 1984, selling more than two million units and was unfortunately another victim of the video game crash. Who knows, if the crash wouldn't happen, we might still be playing Magnavox video game consoles today. Tired of doing the same old thing every night? 
Well, light up those nights with Microvision, Milton Bradley's great new handheld electronic game system. Blockbuster, one of the seven great game cartridges available, comes with a Microvision unit. Switch cartridges to connect four. It's a real mind tease. And for fast action, there's bowling or hitting a jackpot in data slots. So for new excitement, get Microvision, the programmable game system from MB Electronics. The story of the Microvision starts in the mid-1970s. Jay Smith and his firm Smith Engineering wanted to get into the evolving video game market. This is the same Jay Smith that later developed the Vetrix, but instead of creating another home game console, he wanted to make portable games. The first game that Smith helped create was Mattel's Electronic Football. This game became an instant hit for Mattel, which got the attention of Milton Bradley. In 1978, Milton Bradley released the Ralph Baird Design Simon game, which was a huge success. After Simon's success, they wanted to get into the portable handheld market. They saw the success Smith had with the electronic football game and asked Smith Engineering to design a portable game console. Smith got to work on the project. He wanted to create a true portable game console with interchangeable game cartridges, just like the home consoles had. Due to the challenges that this brought, no company had attempted it yet. However, the biggest issue was screen technology at the time. Really only two types of displays were available vacuum fluorescent, like what was used in the electronic football game, or LCD. LCD technology was still relatively new, and the biggest producer of LCD screens at the time was Hughes Aircraft. Earlier in the 1970s, Smith Engineering had started to supply Hughes with the chemical needed to make the screens. With their experience in the manufacturing process, Smith started to design their own screen for the new portable. The finished screen would be 16 by 16 pixels, being able to use all 16 in a row, unheard of at the time. Up to this point, only three rows could be used at once. After the screen was designed, the cartridge was next. The best way for them to do it at the time was to put the CPU inside the cartridge because each game would be different. It would keep cost of the unit down and make it simple to design around. The actual unit only had the screen, the LCD driver circuitry, the controls, and the power components. The rest would be handled by the individual cartridges. Once the prototype was finished, they presented it to Milton Bradley, but the design was denied. It was about the size of the original Game Boy, but Milton Bradley wanted the console to be bigger because apparently Americans like things bigger. So they redesigned the case to be bigger and more elongated. They went back to Milton Bradley and at this time it was approved for production. After the approval, Smith got to work making games for the console. The first games which were ready by the Microvision's release were Blockbuster, Bowling, Connect 4, and Pinball. It was also around this time that there were issues obtaining the CPU, the Intel 8021 processor. With the shortages, Smith knew they could not produce enough units. So they switched over to the Texas Instruments TMS 1100. The unit had advantages and disadvantages. On the plus side, it took less voltage to power the TMS 1100, but the CPU was less powerful, and all the games had to be reprogrammed for the new processor. The Microvision was released in November of 1979 in the US, Canada, and Europe. It was a huge success for them at first, selling enough units to garner $8 million in profit in its first year of sales. By the end of 1979, three more games were released, Mindbuster, Star Trek Phaser Strike, and Vegas Slots. With his perceived success, Smith Engineering invested a lot of money into designing the next Microvision to replace the current one. The new console would have an unheard of 32 by 32 pixel backlit screen and have a CPU based inside the unit. But right about this time, things started to change for the Microvision. Many of the units were filling due to the screen turning completely black, known as screen rot. The manufacturing process for the screens was not the best of quality. The screens may have been contaminated during the manufacturing process in between the layers of the LCD. This is what causes screen rot. Many of the units were being warranted and it was starting to cost Milton Bradley money. Then other issues started to pop up. The cartridges, which housed the CPUs, were very sensitive to static electricity. Just touching the contacts could result in the game frying. Word started to get out about the quality issues and sales started to slump. In 1980 and 81, there were four more games made for the system. Baseball, Sea Duel, Alien Raiders, and Cosmic Hunter. 
These were the last games to be released in the US or Canada. Sometime in 1981, Smith showed Milton Bradley the new improved version of the system they had been working on, but Milton Bradley nixed it right away. This was because of the issues that the current Microvision was having, and then they were starting to get infringement lawsuits over some of the games that were being made for the system. At this point, Milton Bradley was done. They discontinued the Microvision in 1981, and there was one more game released in 1982 in Europe, Super Blockbuster. The Microvision had a two-year lifespan, from 1979 until 1981. It sold about 200,000 units and was the first portable handheld console with interchangeable cartridges and was the inspiration for the future Nintendo Game Boy. I'll try almost anything. So when Mattel Electronics asked me to compare their Intellivision games with Atari, I gave it a try. I compared Atari Baseball with Intellivision and found Intellivision played much more like real baseball. Then I compared Atari Football with Intellivision. Again, Intellivision played more like the real game. In my opinion, if you try them both, there's only one conclusion you can come to. Intellivision from Mattel Electronics. The story of the Intellivision started in 1977. At this time, Mattel had started the Mattel Electronics division to produce the handheld electronic games and started the development of the Intellivision. Mattel wanted something that was better than what the competition had at the time. So they started working with APH Technological Consulting and started shopping for a chipset for the new console. First they worked with National Semiconductor to get a powerful chipset, but they deemed this chipset too expensive. At about the same time, APH consulted with General Instruments. They were interested in the General Instruments chipset named Gemini. The only problem with this chipset is that it didn't have reprogrammable graphics. General Instruments worked with Mattel to create a custom chipset just for Mattel's new game system. Because Mattel had basically went with National Semiconductor first, they waited two months before actually closing the deal with General Instruments for their new chipset. A team of engineers at Mattel headed by David Chandler began work on the development of the hardware. Then in 1978, David Roth of APH developed the exec program that was used to execute the game program. Also with a group of students from Caltech, they started designing the first games for the Intellivision. The Intellivision was debuted at the 1979 Las Vegas CES show in January. The master component system was debuted at a starting price of $165 with the soon to follow keyboard component at the same price of $165. At the Chicago CES show in June, those prices were actually revised to $250 for each unit. This was due to a shortage of chips that were needed for both components. In the fall of 1979, GTE started selling its own branded version of the Intellivision, licensed from Mattel, and they started selling these units in Philadelphia, Baltimore, and Washington, D.C. at its GTE stores at a price of $280. Mattel started distributing consoles to Godluck's department store with a suggested retail price of $275. It was also put into the JCPenney 1979 Christmas catalog. Also listed were seven cartridges with the master component system being priced at $249. By 1981, 19 cartridges were produced by APH Technologies and the students from Caltech. And with the success of these cartridges, Mattel wanted to have their own in-house programmers, codenamed the Blue Sky Rangers. And to keep these programmers from being hired away by the likes of Atari, Mattel kept their identities and their work locations private. In the spring of 1983, Mattel introduced the Intellivision 2, which was a smaller, compact version of the Intellivision. And it was cost reduced to save Mattel money and bring a lower price to the consumer. As we all know, the video game crash came in 1983, and Mattel saw the losses coming as well. During 1983 and 1984, most of the staff from Intellivision Electronics Division was laid off. And on November 4th, 1984, Mattel sold the Intellivision business to the INTV Corporation, which was led by former Mattel's Electronics Senior Vice President of Marketing, Terence Falinski. At first, INTV Corporation sold the remaining inventory of the Intellivision games and consoles. Then they produced what was known as the INTV 3, a rebranded original Intellivision. This was produced until 1990 when the Intellivision finally reached the end of its lifespan. This gave the Intellivision an 11 year run with two different companies. Sales of the unit are vague. When Mattel had control of the company,
they had sold a little less than 3 million units from 1979 to 1983. Unfortunately, I could not find sales figures for the time that the INTV Corporation sold a unit, so I'm not quite sure how many units were sold in total. Let's face it, being sick is better than being in school. But it does get a little boring. I mean, how many Laverne and Shirley reruns can a guy watch? That's why this pocket pinball game is just what the doctor ordered. It's lots of fun, and it's small enough to play anywhere. And the built-in alarm tells me when it's time to get more sympathy. Mom, I need something to drink. You gotta milk a good thing for all it's worth. Pinball, the unboard game by Nintendo. The story of the Game & Watch starts in the 1970s when game designer Gunpai Yokoi, head of Nintendo's research and development of its toys and games division, took a train ride home and noticed a businessman on the train playing with a calculator. This is when the thought came to his head that he could make a game out of calculator parts. An affordable electronic game that you can use to kill time while waiting in line or on train rides seemed like a perfect idea. When he got back to Nintendo, he pitched the idea to Nintendo president Hiroshi Yamamuchi. After the pitch, Yamamuchi asked Yokoi to show for him to a business meeting. I'm sure that request seemed odd, but Yokoi obliged. It turns out that the business meeting was with the CEO of Sharp and Yamamuchi wanted Yokoi to pitch his idea at this meeting. Nintendo and Sharp struck a deal to use Sharp's SN500 series 4-bit microcontrollers for this project. Yokoi had full control over the development. He wanted a game controller kind of like the arcade and actually developed the D-pad. Before long, the first Game & Watch game was made, named Ball. It was a simple game just juggling balls on the LCD screen. This was the first of 60 games to be released on the platform. Nintendo has stated that it used the profit off the Game & Watches to develop the Famicom, which here in the US we all know as the NES, or the Nintendo Entertainment System. And without development of that system, Nintendo might not be the powerhouse they are today, and video game history may have been completely changed. With the launch date in 1980, and it being discontinued in 1991, the Game & Watch series had a successful 11-year run. During that time, Nintendo sold 43.3 million of these units, making it the Kickstarter for the Nintendo Entertainment System and for the Nintendo Corporation as a whole. Now you can bring the arcade experience home, introducing ColecoVision, the most advanced video game system you can buy. It plays more games than any other system. Arcade games with multiple screens like Donkey Kong. Arcade games like Zaxxon with its three-dimensional look. Adventure with 15 different screens. Cosmic Avenger and ColecoVision's new Smurf game. Coming soon, ColecoVision's first expansion module that lets you play all the Atari VCS compatible cartridges. Now you can bring the arcade experience home because your vision is our vision. ColecoVision. The story of the ColecoVision starts in the late 1970s. Coleco did well in the electronics video game market and wanted to continue their success. In 1979, Arnold Greensburg wanted to create a programmable home video game console with arcade quality games made up with off-the-shelf parts. Eric Brimley and his engineering team began to design the ColecoVision. In 1979, they had already developed a prototype system that used a Texas Instrument chip for the video and a General Instruments chip for the audio. But because of the high cost of RAM at the time, it was not approved but shelved for a later date. By early 1982, that later date had come. The cost of RAM had fallen and Brumley saw that the cost was well within the profit margin now. Development of the ColecoVision was very fast, as the system was already developed and was just shelved. The ColecoVision was launched in August of 1982, and by Christmas of 82, had already sold over 500,000 units. In early 1983, more than 1 million units had already sold, greatly surpassing what their biggest rival, the Atari 5200, was doing. Sales were looking good, and Coleco decided to launch the Coleco Atom computer. Unfortunately, this was the beginning of the end for Coleco. The Atom was not a success, due to bad manufacturing and defects which gave Coleco a bad name. And then it happened, the video game crash. With horrible sales of the Atom, and the ColecoVision sales plummeting along with the sales of its games, by 1985 Coleco had announced the discontinuation of the Atom computer, and in October, of the ColecoVision. 
This gave the Coleco a 37 month run, selling just under 2 million units in that time frame. Unfortunately for Coleco, the timing was just bad when they released it. Had they released it in 1979, we might still be playing Coleco video game systems today. Nobody would question the quality of the graphics and the games of the ColecoVision, far beating what Atari or any other video game system was doing at the time. Just another example of being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Coleco went on to produce the Cabbage Patch dolls, which kept them afloat for a few more years. But by 1988, Coleco had filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy, and by 1989, what was left of Coleco was swallowed up by the toy giant Hasbro. Give up my Atari? My television? How about for this? You bet your asteroids. Introducing the revolutionary Vectrex arcade system. No TV set needed. Instead, Vectrex has a real arcade screen built in. So you get challenging real arcade graphics and sounds with every Vectrex cartridge. No wonder Vectrex was chosen two to one over Atari and Intellivision for real arcade gameplay. So compare. Discover how Vectrex brings real arcade play home. The story of the Vectrex starts in the arcades of the late 70s and early 80s. Games like Asteroids, Tempest, and Lunar Lander were becoming all the rage due to their higher resolution vector graphics that conventional CRT and sprite arcade games just couldn't compete with at the time. Around this time in 1980, John Ross of Smith Engineering and some colleagues were shopping at the Electro Maven, an electronic surplus store that was located in California at the time. While there, John spotted a small CRT, about an inch in size, and thought about making a small electronic game using this CRT using Vectrex graphics. They started working on a small handheld device they called the Mini Arcade. It used a standard CRT, but connected the deflection yoke to a stereo amp to produce Vectrex visuals of the music being played. This was possible because they used an auxiliary yoke to run the horizontal flyback circuitry producing Vectrex graphics rather than scanline on standard CRT. Although it didn't play games yet, it showed proof of concept that Vectrex type displays could be made cheaply enough to produce a game console with it. Smith Engineering then started to show the device off, trying to find an investor or company to buy it. During this time, the system started to evolve from a handheld device to a tabletop console using a 9 inch screen. In 1981, General Consumer Electronics licensed the technology. This is when the Vectrex as we know it was developed. The hardware was approved upon and the software was created so that games could be played on it. The hardware and the software being developed by Jerry Carr. I am the night automated roving robot, the first in a bold new experiment. You may call me Carr. No, not that car. This car, Jerry Carr. After a brief development period, the Vectrex was unveiled at the 1982 Summer CES show. People at the show marveled at the vector graphics that were displayed on the screen, some comparing it to being just like the arcade. The system was released just a few months later in November of 1982. Sales of the unit were so strong that it caught the attention of Milton Bradley. They bought the rights to the Vectrex from GCE and started production of the Milton Bradley Vectrex. By mid-1983, Milton Bradley had released the console in parts of Europe and struck a deal with Bandai to distribute it in Japan. However, 1983 is synonymous with the video game crash. Faith in the video game industry due to massive amounts of poor games being dumped into the market caused consumers to quit buying game consoles. Although the Vectrex was an amazing system, it too was affected by the decline in sales. To try to ramp up sales, Milton Bradley brought the cost of the system down by 25%, then 50%. This affected profits, and they were taking huge losses. In fact, they lost over $31 million on the Vectrex by 1984. By February 1984, Milton Bradley discontinued the console, liquidating the remaining inventory to wholesalers and discount warehouses. Due to how much they lost on the deal, in March, Milton Bradley merged with Hasbro, and all support for the system ended. Before it was discontinued, there were two accessories made for it. The 3D Imager, which was a headset that almost looked like a modern VR headset that you wore to produce color and 3D images from the vector screen. The first ever 3D headset. Also, they produced a light pen to use with some cartridges to draw on the screen. However, even these amazing peripherals could not save the Vectrex. 
The Vetrix was well received. Consumers loved the product and so did tech magazines such as Byte. They stated in a 1982 review, one of the greatest machines we have ever seen. The Vetrix is a good bet to score big with the consumer. Even with the screen overlays, which were not popular with other game consoles, they scored big. You bet your asteroid. The only real complaint consumers had was the buzzing noise that the machine made through its speaker. This was a design flaw that was fixed, or should I say fixed loosely, in a newer revision getting rid of the ground loop that caused the issue. Unfortunately, the Vetrix was another great console that had a short lifespan because of the video game crash. With it being discontinued in 1982, it had a short two-year lifespan from January of 1982 until February of 1984. Sales of the unit vary from source to source, but I'll say more than 30,000 units were sold in that time frame. It was the first and only video game console to bring arcade quality vector graphics into the home. Arcade players, get ready. The new Atari 5200 Super System is here. With a controller so advanced, it plays arcade. Graphics so real, it looks arcade. With arcade hits, you can't play on any other system. No other home video system can touch it. The new Atari 5200 Super System. It's as good as you are. Maybe even better. Next time. In late 1977, Atari had already been purchased by Warner Communications. The story of the 5200 starts after that. Nolan Bushnell was still with the company and Warner Communications had already started the successor of the 2600 and there was actually talks of them discontinuing it. Bushnell disagreed with this and along with other issues that he had with Warner Communications, he decided to leave the company. That's how I'm going to tell it. Warner would probably tell it a different way, but I'm taking Bushnell's side of this story. Warner started development of the successor to the 2600, but 1977 is known as the year of the personal computer revolution. This is the year that the Apple II, Commodore PET, and that TRS-80 launched, bringing the personal computer to many homes and businesses. Atari had seen this and wanted in on the lucrative personal computing market, so instead of developing the next video game system, they used the technology to develop the Atari 8-bit line of computers. Now at this time, the only real competition that Atari had was the Fairchild Channel F, the Bally Astrocade, and the Magnavox Odyssey 2. But fast forward a couple years, and Mattel had released the Intellivision in 1979, and in 1982, Coleco released the ColecoVision. Both of which had add-ons that could play the Atari 2600 cartridges and had superior graphics to the 2600. Atari knew that they had to do something and they unshelved the console prototype from 1978. They developed it into the Atari Video System X, which a few prototypes were actually made. The name was changed to the Atari 5200. The 5200 was officially launched in November of 1982. Atari had released a decently powerful video game console to compete with the Coleco and Intellivision. However, the timing was completely wrong. The controllers were horrible, and the games were just the same old arcade ports like on the Atari 2600. And it wasn't backwards compatible with the 2600, nor was it compatible with the 8-bit line of computers. And because of this, consumers just couldn't justify the cost of buying a new game console for the same old games, but with a little bit better graphics, and of course it had the bad reputation for the controllers as well. After its release, it did sell a few units, but it did not meet Atari's sales expectations. Atari had even gone as far as designing a slim version of the Atari 5200 called the Atari 5200 Junior or the 5100. However, since sales were slow, this project was cancelled. A few of those prototypes do exist and they're out there in the wild as well. And then in 1983, the video game crash came and sales of the system plummeted, along with the sales of the Atari 2600. Atari discontinued the 5200 in May of 1984, giving it a lifespan of only 18 months. And shortly after this, Warner Communications sold Atari to Jack Tramiel. The 5200 just sold over 1 million units. Although it was a powerful machine, it was not a success for Atari. Sega Video Game SG 1000. 
The story of Sega starts in World War II in 1940. American businessmen Martin Bromley, Irving Bromberg, and James Humpert started standard games in Hawaii to supply coin-operated games such as slot machines to American bases during the war. The business also served the civilian market as well. It was successful, but after the war they sold standard games off and created a new company called Service Games, with its main focus being games for the military. In 1952, the U.S. government banned slot machines in U.S. territories, which took a chunk out of Service Games' pockets. To marginalize its losses, they established Service Games of Japan to provide slot machines to U.S. bases in Japan. A year later, they started Service Games of Panama to control their entities worldwide. In 1954, Service Games released a slot machine named Diamond 3 Star, and was the first product with the shortened Service Games name, abbreviated to Sega on it. In the next few years, they expanded their business to distribute machines in South Korea, the Philippines, and South Vietnam. By 1960, criminal organizations were starting to use slot machines in their unlicensed gambling houses. Because of this, the U.S. government started an investigation into illegal gambling. Service Games saw that this was the end of their lucrative slot machine business and dissolved Service Games of Japan on May 31st. Three days later, Bromley started two new businesses to take over the business that Service Games left behind. Nihon Gorako Busan and Nihon Kenkai Sizu. The two newly formed companies bought all the assets from Service Games of Japan. Kenkai Sizu started business as Sega Incorporated and focused solely on the slot machine business. Guraku Busan, doing business as Ultimatic, was a distributor of coin-op machines such as jukeboxes and pinball. In 1964, the companies merged into one. In 1965, Nuhon Guraku Busan acquired Rosen Enterprises, another coin-op game company that was owned by David Rosen. After the acquisition, Nuhon Guraku Busan changed its name to Sega Limited and stopped leasing games to military bases and focused solely on distributing coin-op amusement machines such as Rockola jukeboxes, Williams pinball machines, and Midway shooting games. Also at this time, Rosen was made CEO of Sega Limited. By the late 1960s, Sega had been distributing machines, but many of the machines broke and had to be fixed. Sega got sick of trying to outsource the parts needed to quickly get the machines running again, so they decided to make their own parts for the machines. This quickly evolved into Sega making their first electromechanical game called Periscope. With its amazing gameplay, effects, lights, and sounds, it was quite a success for Sega. In 1969, Sega Limited was sold off to American investor Golf and Western Industries. In 1973, Sega made their first video game based arcade game, Pongtron, a Pong clone. In 1974, Sega Limited changed their name again to Sega Enterprises Limited. Sega enjoyed success in the arcade video game market in the 1970s. So much so, it licensed Frogger and created the famous 3D shooter game Zaxxon. They acquired Gremlin Industries, a microprocessor based arcade game manufacturer, in 1983. Also around this time, they acquired another company named Esco Baruki, a coin op distributor owned by Hayao. Nakayama. Nakayama was put into the president position at Sega's Japanese operations. But by 1982, the arcade industry started seeing a downfall in profits. Golf and Western sold off its North American arcade division to Bally Manufacturing in 1983, but retained American R&D division and its Sega Enterprises Limited division. Right around this time, Nakayama wanted to get into the home computer market. They started development of the SC3000. It was an 8-bit computer powered by a Z80 processor. Almost simultaneously, they heard that the game company Nintendo was creating a video game console for the home market. Sega wanted to get into this market as well. They took the same technology from the SC3000 computer and turned it into the home video game console named the SG-1000. Both systems were released in 1983. The SG-1000 became a success for Sega. Released the same day as Nintendo released the Famicom, it was only predicted to sell about 50,000 units by the end of the year. But by the end of 1983, they had sold over 160,000 units. However, the success didn't last. Due to Nintendo having third-party developers working on their games, the Famicom started to outsell the SG-1000 by tenfold. Also in 1983, Golf and Western decided to divest the rest of their assets in Sega. 
Rosen stepped down as CEO and partnered with Nakayama to buy out Sega Enterprises. After the acquisition, Nakayama was named CEO of Sega Enterprises. In 1984, Sega released an updated version of the SG-1000 called the SG-1000 Mark II, or Mark II for short. This system was backward compatible with both the SC-3000 and the SC-1000's games. The case design was changed, putting the expansion port in the front, and it had detachable controllers as well. The SG-1000 was discontinued in 1984 and the SG-1000 Mark II and SC-3000 in 1986 to make the room for the next video game console, the Sega Mark III, which eventually became the Master System. The SG series of game consoles had a three-year lifespan from the launch of the SG-1000 in 1983 until the discontinuation of the SG-1000 Mark II in 1986. The SG series of consoles sold over 1.4 million units in total. Although not a huge success, it was successful enough to kickstart Sega into the video game industry and was Sega's first video game console. What's it like to play the Nintendo Entertainment System? Entertainment system. Now you're playing with power. The NES story starts in the arcades of the early 1980s. Nintendo's success with games such as Donkey Kong led Nintendo's president, Harushi Yamamuchi, to call for a game console based on arcade machines like Galaxian and Donkey Kong. Originally, it was supposed to be a 16 bit home computer with floppy drives and a keyboard, but Yamamuchi rejected this plan. He wanted a cheaper system that people didn't need to be technophiles to be able to use. At this point, Masuki Yorama began the design by October of 1982 and had a test model or prototype built. However, no programming tools were available, so programming started on the NEC PC-8001 computer, or the PC-88. The PC-88 connected to a grid of LEDs to create the graphics for the games. The project was named Gamecom, but this name was actually changed to Famicom with the suggestion of Yorama's wife. The Famicom was heavily influenced by the ColecoVision. Nintendo saw how much better the games looked on the Coleco as opposed to other consoles like the Atari 2600. They really thought that they would be competing with Coleco in the future and wanted to come up with something that could produce arcade quality graphics. The console was released on July 15, 1983, only in Japan, with three games being released with the system at the time, Donkey Kong, Donkey Kong Jr., and Popeye. The console released with some issues due to some manufacturing defects. There were some issues with the chips inside that caused the system to crash. But after a recall, the Famicom enjoyed success, much success and by 1984 was the best-selling console in Japan. Also in 1984, Nintendo agreed to have third-party publishers make games on it. The first two publishers were Namco and Hudson Soft. They agreed to a deal for a 30% fee to Nintendo for console licensing and production cost. This was an industry standard in the video game market up until 2010. Now Nintendo had its sights on North America, However, they were still skeptical of going into the market alone. In 1983, Nintendo started negotiations with Atari to market the Famicom under Atari's name in North America. The deal was supposed to be signed at the CES show in 1983. However, Atari saw a Nintendo Donkey Kong Coleco cartridge being used in a Coleco display. And at this point, they nixed the deal with Nintendo. Now Nintendo decided to go for it on their own. The first idea was to package it as the Nintendo Advanced Video Game System, or AVS. This would include a repackaged Famicom, a keyboard, a cassette, a data recorder, and a wireless joystick, and a basic ROM cartridge. Nintendo decided against this as it would be too expensive for the regular consumer. And with the video game crash, they were worried that the console and computer just wouldn't sell. So Nintendo first used the Famicom hardware in North America in the Versus arcade cabinets. This was basically just a test to see how gamers would react to what was really a home video game console in a cabinet. It was a huge success. 
The Versus system became the highest grossing arcade cabinet by 1985 in the United States. With this, Nintendo went ahead and designed the North American Famicom system. The system would have a front-loading assembly that resembled a VCR for user familiarity. It also helped prevent ESD, or electronic static discharge, in dry climates like Nevada or Arizona. The new case was designed by Lance Barr. At this point, the Nintendo AVS system was renamed to the Nintendo Entertainment System. The change came due to Nintendo wanting to distance itself from the video game market after the crash, and that's why it's not called the Nintendo Video Game System. It released in two test markets, in New York City in October of 1985 and in Los Angeles in February of 1986. It was very successful in both of those markets, so Nintendo decided to release the NES nationwide on September 27, 1986. Now as technology advanced, obviously game consoles are going to be discontinued. The NES was discontinued in 1995, giving it a 9 year run in the North American market. Now the Famicom on the other hand, was discontinued in the year 2000. So it gave the console a 17 year run on the market in Japan. Of course over its lifetime, and all the different iterations from the Famicom to the NES, it sold about 62 million units the best-selling console up to this point. Sega challenges you with the ultimate video game, the Sega Master System, with twice as much memory as any other video game. Advanced video technology like scrolling backgrounds, graphics in 64 colors, digital sounds, and light phasers. And you can add to the excitement with sports pads, control sticks, and the first video games ever in 3D. Sega's the one. The Sega Master System. The challenge will always be there. The story of the Sega Master System really starts in 1983. With the release of its first game console, the SG-1000 in Japan, it was released on the same day as Nintendo's Famicom, but unfortunately did not see the success that Nintendo did. In 1984, Sega's parent company, Golf and Western Industries, divested in non-core businesses, including Sega. Sega now owned itself, and put Nakayama as CEO of the newly founded Sega Enterprises. Also in 1984, Sega released another console called the SG-1000 Mark II. This featured several hardware revisions and detachable controllers. Then, in 1985, Sega released the Sega Mark III, which was another redesign of the original SG-1000. It was engineered by Hidoku Soto and Masami Ishiwaka. According to Sato, the console was designed due to the limitations of the SG-1000's GPU, and they wanted something that would be able to compete with the graphics of the Nintendo. So they designed a new graphics chip based on the Sega System 2 arcade board. The Mark III was released in October of 1985 in Japan only, but they had problems finding publishers due to the licensing agreements that Nintendo already had set up with most companies. And once again, Sega had a console that was not very successful in Japan. Sega knew they had a great video game system and wanted to release it worldwide to compete with the likes of Nintendo and Atari. In 1986, Sega formed Sega of America with Bruce Lorre Nintendo of America's former Vice President of Sales heading this group. Rebranded as the Master System, the system itself was redesigned, appealing more to the American market. It was first revealed in the Summer CES show in Chicago in 1986. The console itself was launched in September of 1986 at a price of $200 in the United States. Sega hoped to sell more than 700,000 units by the end of 1986. But unfortunately, their projections fell short, only selling 125,000 units, while Nintendo at the same point sold more than 1.1 million units. Just like in Japan, Nintendo had licensing agreements with most American publishers, leading to Sega to develop pretty much their own video game library and not having the help of third-party developers. In 1987, Sega sold the distribution rights to the Master System to toy company Tonka, Nintendo had marketed the Nintendo Entertainment System as a toy, so Sega felt that if they marketed it with a toy company, it might increase sales. Taka had purchased Kenner Toys in 1987, and after a horrible Christmas season, funds were running low for Taka. In 1988, there was an EEPROM shortage. Taka didn't want to buy the expensive EEPROMs, 
and not being able to distribute very many games for the Master System, further decreasing sales for Sega. Also in 1987, the Mark III was re-released as the Master System in Japan and did not sell very well. Now Sega had to move to more markets. They closed the deal in 1987 to have the Master System distributed by Mastertronic in the United Kingdom. Advanced orders of the system were very high, but unfortunately the demand was not met as units were not made until Boxing Day, making shipments late. Mastertronic sold the rest of their shares to Virgin to form Virgin Mastertronic, which took over all European distribution in 1988. By 1990, the Master System was the best-selling console in Europe, selling more than 918,000 consoles, greater than Nintendo's 655,000 units. This had European developers pushing to develop for the console, unlike in Japan or the United States. The Sega Master System was also very successful in Brazil, being marketed by Tectoy. The Sega Master System, although not initially successful, it did enjoy success in Europe, Brazil, and other parts of the world. Being released in Japan in 1985 and being discontinued in Brazil in 1998 gave the console an amazing 13-year run with worldwide sales between Sega and Tectoy ranging between 20 to 21 million units. Atari just reinvented the video game with this, the Atari 7800. Incredible, huh? Uh, <laughs> so powerful it plays like the best arcade game with real joysticks, right? <laughs> uh, so advanced to play super games, computer games no other video game system ever played. Just look at these. It even plays all Atari 2600 games. Great, huh? Oh, the new Atari 7800. We reinvented the video game. The story of the Atari 7800 starts in 1982. After the release of the Atari 5200, Atari was already getting complaints from consumers that the system was not that great. Controller issues, no backward compatibility with the 2600, and most of the games were the same arcade ports that were already on the 2600. Sales figures supported this, as the system was not selling well. Atari knew it had to come up with a new video game system to compete with the ColecoVision. But after Warner Communications took over the company from Nolan Bushnell, most of the brilliant engineers that Atari had left. So for the first time in Atari's history, they had to outsource a company to design their new game system. Right about this time, a small startup company named General Computer Corporation was making arcade mods for popular arcade machines one of which was Super Missile Attack, a mod of Atari's Missile Command. Atari got wind of this and sued General Computer Corporation for copyright infringement. But once Atari saw the mods, they cut a deal with GCC to hire them to produce the mods under Atari's name. They also had them start developing arcade games for Atari as well, such as Food Fight and Quantum. Then Atari had them start development on the then called Atari 3600 video game console. It was to be backwards compatible with the 2600 and have arcade quality graphics that can compete with the ColecoVision. Development started in 1983 and was ready for production in 1984 with the launch of 15 titles, a high score cart, and it even had a keyboard accessory. It was renamed the Atari 7800 Pro System. But Atari was going through its own changes. The video game crash started in 1983 and with it took a lot of profit out of the gaming industry. Atari was at the heart of it due to so many bad games being released on the 2600. Warner Communications knew this and they wanted out. In 1984, Atari's consumer division was bought out by former Commodore president Jack Trammell. It was Jack's decision to cancel the Atari 7800 project and shelve it due to the gaming consoles not being profitable after the crash. And Atari focused more on its computer division. Fast forward a couple years to 1986, with the release of Nintendo's NES and seeing how successful it was, Trammell decided to unshelf the Atari 7800. Unfortunately for Atari, by this time the system was outdated and really was not a competitor to the NES or the Sega Master System. The system wasn't that successful, selling just over 100,000 units in 1986, far below what Nintendo had sold. A total of 57 games were released for the system. It was discontinued in 1992 along with the 2600 and the 8-bit line of computers. 
This is the Nintendo video game system. It plays only cartridge games. This is the new Atari XE system. It plays cartridge and disc-based games. Disc drives sold separately, and only Atari comes with a real joystick. Both have guns, but only Atari comes with the target game, Bug Hunt. Nintendo has a toy robot, but only Atari gives you a keyboard for playing advanced computer games. It even comes with the amazing Flight Simulator 2 cartridge. The new Atari XE video game system. Unbeatable. The story of the XEGS starts way back in the 1970s. Nolan Bushnell had sold Atari to Time Warner Communications in 1976 to help pull Atari out of its financial bind. In 1977, Atari started development of a new 8-bit game console. As popular as the Atari 2600 was, it was underpowered and Atari knew this. The top executives at Atari saw how successful the personal computer market was becoming with the release of the Commodore PET, Apple II, and the TRS-80. In fact, 1977 is known as the year of the personal computer because of this. The top brass at Atari took the technology from the 8-bit game system that was being developed and turned it into the Atari 8-bit line of computers, the 400 and the 800. Nolan Bushnell and most of the engineers at Atari saw this as bad marketing and started to leave Atari at this point. Fast forward a few years to the early 1980s. Atari now had competition in the video game console market with the Intellivision and the ColecoVision, and they knew they had to come up with a system that had arcade quality graphics and sound. They reverse engineered the Atari 8-bit computer into a game console that we all know as the Atari 5200. In essence, the 5200 is an Atari 8-bit computer under the hood, but Atari made it so it was incompatible with the 8-bit computer carts, did not support a floppy or cassette drive, nor was it backboard compatible to the 2600 without the additional 2600 add-on. Along with the horrible analog controllers and the same arcade ports that were already on the 2600, consumers just didn't buy the system. It was right about this time in 1983 that the video game crash started, diminishing the video game market and making it unprofitable. A lot of companies pulled out of the market and Time Warner was no different. In 1984, they sold Atari to former Commodore president Jack Trammell. When Jack took over the company, his primary focus was on computers. He even shelved the then-completed Atari 7800 game console because he thought releasing it after the crash would be unprofitable. But Nintendo released the NES in 1985 and took the gaming world by storm, showing video game consoles could be profitable once again. In 1986, Atari then released the 7800, but it was too late to compete with Nintendo and another new competitor, Sega. After seeing that the 7800 was not going to be the success they thought it would be, Atari had to come up with something quick to try to compete in the market. They went back to the hybrid console computer idea that they had with the 5200, but this time it would be compatible with the 8-bit carts, support drives, and have a keyboard, light gun, and even have basic on the ROM. It was marketed as a video game console that could be expanded to a full-blown computer. So Atari started development of the Atari XEGS. The XEGS is really a redesigned Atari 65 XE computer that was made to be a standalone video game console. The system was as powerful, if not more powerful, than either the NES or the Sega Master System. Atari thought they had a hit on their hands. The shell of the system was designed to fit the times, a radical case and fluorescent colored buttons along with the Buck Rogers style light gun. It also had a redesigned detachable full QWERTY keyboard. But the reality of the system is far different than what it appeared. Atari made these systems as cheap as they could to get rid of the 8-bit component inventory, getting ready to discontinue the 8-bit computer systems, making way for the 16-bit line of ST computers. These systems are plagued with issues because of this. From failing system ROMs, cold solder joints, bad RAM, and MMU issues, the system was starting to get a bad reputation. Initial sales of the unit looked good, selling out of the 100,000 units that they made during the Christmas season, but sales slumped afterward as the build quality issues started to pop up. Also by this time, most people already had an NES or a Sega Master System. Atari supported the XEGS until 1992, when it was discontinued with the 2600, 7800, and the Atari 8-bit line of computers. The Atari XEGS had a 5-year lifespan from 1987 to 1992. It sold over 100,000 units and is considered to be the last 8-bit computer Atari produced. Or was it a console? You guys be the judge. First, there was Atari. Then, there was Nintendo. No! 
generation video games. Turbo Graphics 16 and Turbo Graphics CD for live video video games and 2,000 times more memory. Turbo Express Portable, Turbo Chip Compatibility, Basic System 99.99. Turbo Graphics 16, the next generation now. The story of the NEC PC Engine and Turbo Graphics 16 starts in the early 1980s. NEC, also known as Nippon Electronic Company, a communications company at the time, started getting into the home personal computing market. They developed a computer called the PC-88. By 1981, the PC-88 held 40% of Japan's personal computing market. And just like any other personal computer of the time, video games were a major portion of its market share. In 1982, Nintendo contacted NEC to help develop games for their upcoming Famicom system. The first few games developed for the Famicom were developed on the PC-88 because Nintendo hadn't completed their development kit yet. By working with Nintendo, NEC got the itch to get into the gaming market. They worked with a third-party developer, Hudsonsoft, to acquire a license to port some of the Nintendo games over to the PC-88 including Excitebike, Balloon Fight, Tennis, Golf, and Ice Climber. They even created three new Nintendo games just for the system, Super Mario Bros. Special, Punch Ball Mario Bros., and Donkey Kong 3. NEC really wanted to get into the gaming market at this time, but were afraid because of the video game crash and seeing other game companies fail. They watched the Famicom in Japan and the NES around the world become a huge success for Nintendo. They also saw Sega starting to have success as well, and they knew it was time to get into the market. By this time, NEC had released a PC-98, which was a 16-bit microcomputer and eventually evolved into a 32-bit machine. This gave NEC an advantage as they were already working within the 16-bit realm. By 1986, Hudson and NEC partnered up to start development of a new video game system. Earlier, Hudson had contacted Nintendo to try and sell them the advanced chipset for their next video game console, but Nintendo declined, so Hudson found a new partner in NEC. Hudson had developed an 8-bit CPU that essentially was the same as the 65CO2 processor. They coupled this processor with two 16-bit graphic processors, the first one being the video display controller and the second being the video color encoder. Development of the console was quick due to most of the hardware already being completed. NEC already had software support from Hudson, but also brought in other third-party developers such as Namco and Konami to develop games for the system. They released the PC Engine on October 30th, 1987 in Japan. It instantly became a hit, selling more than 500,000 units in the first week, taking the lead in the Japanese gaming market. The system had good quality games from great third-party developers, a small but elegant design, and had a small compact credit card sized game cartridge called a Hue card. With the success that NEC was having with the PC Engine, most would think that this would be the end of the story. However, it was just the beginning. NEC decided that they were going to do two things in 1988. One, they would expand the market to North America, and two, they would create a new CD-ROM add-on for the PC Engine. Development of the North American PC Engine started. However, it was found that Americans like things big and not small, so they decided to make the console bigger. Also, the name PC Engine was not very popular with the polls taken in America, so they decided to name the new system the TurboGrafx-16, based off its 16-bit video chip architecture. But development of the system was a slow process and delayed the release in North America. Meanwhile, in Japan, development of the CD-ROM was moving along quickly, and by December of 1988, it was released. This made the PC Engine the very first video game console to use the CD-ROM media format. They sold over 60,000 units in the first five months, and by the end of the third fiscal quarter of 1989, sold more than 80,000 CD-ROM units and 1.2 million PC Engine consoles. By mid-1989, development of the North American TurboGrafx-16 had been completed, and the consoles were beginning to be produced. It launched in August of 1989 in limited quantities in the Los Angeles and New York test markets. Unfortunately for NEC, this was two weeks after Sega launched the Genesis in America with the arcade hit Altered Beast packed in. Unlike NEC, Sega didn't waste time redesigning the console for the American market and launched it as quickly as they could with a great pack-in game. While NEC wasted almost two years for the Americanized console to be developed, 
and packed in the game Keith Courage in Alpha Zones, which really nobody in North America was familiar with. The TurboGrafx-16 add-on released shortly after, but was priced at $399 by itself and no pack-in games. Because of all this, unlike the Japanese market, Sega dominated NEC in North America. Making matters worse, in NEC's contract, Hudson got paid for each console that was produced, sold or not, and they made 750,000 units in the stagnant North American market, costing NEC millions. Now over in Japan, things were a lot different. In fact, sales of the PC Engine were skyrocketing, and they launched three new models of the PC Engine in 1989. The first called the PC Engine Core Graphics. Other than a slightly updated CPU and the addition of composite AV instead of RF video, it was essentially the same as the PC Engine, just with a different color scheme being black and blue instead of white and red. And it had an updated controller with turbo capabilities. The second model was the PC Engine Super Graphics, which was an enhanced PC Engine with upgraded RAM, a second video display controller, and a video display processor to combine the VDCs. It also had an updated CPU. However, the system was quite expensive and was not very popular. Only five exclusive games were released for it, and it was soon canceled. The third model was the PC Engine Shuttle. It was a cost-reduced version of the PC Engine targeted towards children, and it was shaped somewhat like a spaceship. In fact, if you look closely, I think Atari took some design cues from this for their Atari Jaguar. This also had an AV out, with the main difference being it had no expansion port, so it could not be connected to the CD-ROM add-on. This model was somewhat successful in Japan, and was also distributed in South Korea. Also in 1989, NEC released a PC Engine in Europe, starting with France. It was a well-liked console in France, with major retailers selling the console. But by this time, NEC was seeing the TurboGrafx-16 in North America not being successful, and decided to cancel the rest of the European launch. The units that were produced for the UK were North American units converted to PAL. NEC sold this inventory to distributors. Telegames released the console in 1990 in very limited quantities. In 1990, NEC released another new model of the PC Engine, but this time it was to take your games on the go. The PC Engine GT was released in Japan on December 1st, 1990, and then in the United States as the Turbo Express. It was a portable version of the PC Engine with a backlit 2.6 inch LCD screen, which at the time was way more advanced than Nintendo's Game Boy. However, because of its high price and its short battery life, it didn't do too well in the market. NEC was way ahead of its time, looking at the success of the Nintendo Switch now. Speaking of Nintendo, the Super Famicom launched in Japan on November of 1990, giving NEC true competition with Nintendo for the first time. By mid-1991, NEC had finally sold the 750,000 units that were produced in 1989 in North America. But on a positive note, worldwide they had sold over 500,000 CD-ROM units. In June, NEC released the Core Graphics 2. They put the original HUC6280 CPU back into the unit and changed the case colors again. Nintendo released the SNES in North America in August. In September, NEC releases the PC Engine Duo in Japan. This combines the PC Engine and the CD-ROM all in one unit. Once again, this unit becomes successful in Japan. In December, NEC releases two new products in Japan. The Super CD-ROM, which had an updated BIOS, increased RAM to 256 kilobits, and was able to directly connect to the back of the PC Engine without an adapter. They also released the PC Engine LT, which was a PC Engine in a laptop form factor with an attached screen. It did not have its own battery, so you had to plug it in for power. Not too many of these consoles were made, and they're very rare today. By mid-1992, NEC and Hudson had agreed to transfer management in North America over to a joint venture called Turbo Technologies Incorporated. This was a move to try to remarket the TurboGrafx-16 in North America. In October, they released the Turbo Duo in North America, but by this time, they faced stiff competition with Nintendo and Sega, which were currently dominating the market. The numbers don't lie, and the TurboGrafx-16 and the Turbo Duo just were not successful outside of Japan. In Japan, the PC Engine Duo was selling well. In fact, two updated versions were made. The PC Engine Duo R, released in 1993, and the PC Engine Duo RX, 
to 1994. These consoles essentially had cosmetic changes from the original, but the RX included a new six-button controller. By the end of 1994, things were definitely taking a toll on NEC. The lucrative gaming market that they had held a lead in the market share in Japan initially had faded long away. Nintendo and Sega were dominating the market, and a newcomer Sony was on the horizon. NEC discontinued the PC Engine and TurboGrafx-16 in 1994 in North America, Japan, and France. And at this point, Turbo Technologies Incorporated discontinued the Turbo Duo in North America as well. While in Japan, the PC Engine Duo lasted another year until 1995. But amazingly, the last licensed game for the PC Engine was Dead on the Brain Part 1 and 2, which was released on June 3, 1999 in the Super CD format. The PC Engine was released in 1987 and the Turbo Graphics in 1989. They were completely discontinued by 1995, giving the console an 8-year lifespan and being the first video game console to use the CD-ROM media format. And so it was, late in the 20th century, that a pox fell upon the land, a plague of home videos that were limited in intelligence. There was brain drain, and terminal boredom swept the countryside. The maker looked down and was not pleased by what he saw and said, this is not good. And so it was, he brought forth Genesis, a system with twice the power, twice the intelligence, twice the challenge, twice the fun. Only a chosen few were called forth to experience this new dimension of high-definition graphics and studio sound. And the maker saw what he had done and said, Now that, that's not bad. Discover Genesis, and your world will never be the same. The story of the Sega Genesis actually started in the early 1980s. Sega's arcade sales were starting to slump, and they saw the need to get into the home console market. The push to get into the home console market was led by Sega Enterprises Limited president Oyo Nakayama. In 1983, Sega released the SG-1000 in Japan, but the system didn't fare well against Nintendo's Famicom. In 1984, Sega arranged a buyout of their owner, Gulf and Western, which Sega was a subsidiary of. Nakayama was named president of the newly formed Sega Enterprises. Within two years of the SG-1000's release, Sega released another console named the Mark III. Now we all in North America know the Mark III as the Sega Master System, which was released here in the United States in 1986 to compete with the Nintendo in the American market. However, just like in Japan unfortunately, the Master System wasn't very successful, which Sega already anticipated, and within just a few days of launching the Master System in the United States, Work already began on a new console. With two of Sega's best R&D engineers at the helm, Hideki Sato and Masumi Ishikawa. In 1987, another stroke of bad luck hit Sega. NEC, one of Japan's biggest electronic companies, decided to launch the PC Engine. Sega at this point saw the need for a 16-bit system because of the release of the PC Engine and rumors of a 16-bit console being developed by Nintendo. So the decision was made by Ishikawa to develop a system with a 16-bit microprocessor and a second 8-bit Zilog coprocessor to help take the load off the main processor for the system sound. The exterior of the console was designed to emulate the look of audio equipment at the time and also the interior of automobiles. This decision was made to distance itself from toy-looking consoles hoping to attract older consumers. The Mega Drive was released in Japan on October 29, 1988. Unfortunately for Sega, its release was one week after the Super Mario Bros. 3 game was released on the Nintendo. And with the PC Engine being very popular in Japan as well, Sega was running a distant third in the console race. Sega now knew at this point it needed to act in North America and fast. Tonka, the American toy company, was distributing the Master System for the Sega at the time, but Sega was not impressed by their marketing tactics. So for the Sega Genesis distribution, they decided to seek help from another company. Sega then contacted Atari and made a proposal with CEO Jack Trammell, 
but Tremel refused the offer, instead deciding to work on the Atari ST line of computers. So at this point, Sega basically said, screw everybody, and opened its own Sega of America division to handle marketing and distribution of the Sega Genesis. The Genesis launched to a limited market just like the NES did previously. This was done to test the American market before the full release. It was launched in New York City and Los Angeles on August 14, 1989. Due to the successful sales of the console, it was released to the rest of the United States later that year in several batches. Sega in different parts of the world decided to distribute the console through different companies as well. It was released in Europe and Brazil in September of 1990 and in other parts of the world with different distributors on various dates. Marketing in North America was handled by former Atari Corporation Entertainment Electronics Division President Michael Katz. He wanted to market the system for its arcade-like gameplay and graphics and came up with the slogan, Genesis does what Nintendo don't. But by mid-1990, Katz did not reach the sales goal set by Nakayama for a million units sold. And only 500,000 were sold. So at this point, Nakayama fired and replaced him with Tom Kalatsky. He saw that Nintendo was successful with having iconic video game characters like Mario and wanted to repeat that kind of success. At this point, Sega's mascot was Alex the Kid. Although popular in Japan, in North America, nobody really knew him and didn't relate to the character. Sonic was made to show the speed and graphic capabilities of the Genesis, along with being a cool character as Sega was trying to reach a cooler crowd of gamers. The strategy worked and sales of the Genesis increased. Other marketing techniques were put in place, like reducing the cost of the console, hiring developers that targeted American audiences, and a very aggressive ad campaign. Sega was also successful in creating different add-ons for the system, with the addition of the PowerBase converter, the 32X, and the Sega CD. The Genesis had reached the 32-bit and CD-ROM game market, and having backward capability to the Master System helped sales of the older Master System games as well. Sega also showed their hand in the rating system for video games. In the early to mid-1990s, watchdog groups were condemning video games for the violence that they portrayed. Sega even went to congressional hearings because of games like Mortal Kombat and Night Trap during these proceedings. The video game rating system was set up by December of 1994 and was being put on video games. But since there was a rating system now, Sega decided to release Mortal Kombat 2 completely uncensored and not having to use a code to get the blood or fatalities. They were really the first to test the system and it worked, as we can see by games that are released today. Sega discontinued the Genesis in 1997, selling over 30 million units worldwide. Another 4.5 million units were sold by other distribution companies worldwide as well, bringing the total to about 35 million consoles, with most of these sales being in North America and in Europe. Sega finally achieved success in the home console market with help of great marketing and one little hedgehog. They said it wasn't humanly possible, but now you can have all the power and excitement of Nintendo right in the palm of your hand. Introducing Game Boy. It's portable, it's in stereo, and its games are interchangeable. Plus, Game Boy comes with the outrageous new game, Tetris. And for head-to-head -head competition, use the revolutionary video link and blow your opponent away. Game Boy, only from Nintendo. Now you're playing with power, portable power. The story of the Game Boy starts in the mid-1980s. Gunpai Yokoi held a meeting with Nintendo's president, Hiroshi Yamamuchi, about developing a portable game system with interchangeable cartridges, somewhat like the Milton Bradley Microvision years earlier. However, they would implement a newer screen LCD technology called Dot Matrix. With the popularity of the Game & Watch and its portable design and the success of the Famicom and NES, Yamamuchi was not hesitant to give the go-ahead to start development. Yokoi and Nintendo's R&D One team, led by Satoru Okada, started development of the new system called the Dot Matrix game. Because a joystick would be unpractical on the system, Yokoi wanted to use the D-pad he created on the Game & Watch. Since the NES controller was so popular, they made the controller design almost identical to the NES with the D-pad, A, B, Start, and Select buttons. Also, the system had to be small enough to fit in one's pocket. 
Unlike the Microvision, Nintendo wanted the CPU to be in the system and not on the individual cartridges. For the CPU, Nintendo worked with Sharp to create a custom chip that was a hybrid between the Intel 8080 and the Zilog Z80 CPU. The screen would be a 2.6 inch LCD dot matrix display with a 160 by 144 pixel resolution. During the design phase, Shigatsu Ito saw the prototype and named it the Game Boy. The name stuck, but the dot matrix game name still appeared on the Game Boy as a model number, DMG01. However, not everything was great. Employees within Nintendo didn't like the Game Boy and thought it wouldn't be successful. They even deemed it the Dame Game, which Dame means helpless or useless in Japanese. Despite this, development continued on. In 1987, Nintendo had shown the prototype to several trade shows. Interest grew in the product. Gunpai Yokoi wanted the system to have a great game library. With the popularity of Super Mario Bros. on the NES, they knew the system needed a Mario game for it. Gunpai Yokoi and Sudaro Yokata developed Super Mario Land. It was intended to be the pack-in game with the system worldwide. However, interest in the Russian game Tetris in North America was peaking in popularity at the time, and Nintendo saw this as an opportunity. Hank Rogers bought the rights to the game and worked with Nintendo to port it over to the Game Boy. Tetris was the pack-in game for the system in every region except Japan. Nintendo spent over $10 million marketing the Game Boy before launch. The Game Boy was released in Japan in April of 1989 with the pack-in game Super Mario Land. Then it was released in North America in July and Europe in September of 1990, with Tetris being the pack-in game. The system was wildly successful. In Japan, Nintendo sold out of the entire inventory by March and had to produce more. The system was just as popular around the globe, selling millions of units within the first year. Six games were available at launch, Alleyway, Baseball, Super Mario Land, Tennis, Tetris, and Yakuman. With sales of the console soaring, so did the number of game titles. By 1990, Nintendo had competition with NEC, Sega, and Atari with the PC Engine Express, Turbo GT, Game Gear, and Lynx. But the Game Boy turned out to be the clear winner in this competition. Although it was not as advanced as the others without a color backlit screen, the fact that it had a 14-hour battery life and a lower price made it the leader of the portable game systems of the time. Nintendo was always thinking ahead, and started to think of new ways to market and make the Game Boy better. The first revision of the Game Boy came in 1995 with the Play It Loud Game Boy. These were special edition Game Boys with different color cases that came in red, green, black, yellow, blue, and a clear case. In 1996, Nintendo released the Game Boy Pocket, a smaller cost-reduced version of the original DMG Game Boy. It took two AAA batteries instead of four AA's the original Game Boy took. The screen was changed to a slightly larger 2.56 inch FSTN LCD, which made the screen truly black and white and not the green color the OG Game Boy was, but still was not backlit. Also the power jack and the link port shrunk in size. In 1997, the pocket introduced different color cases. By 1998, Nintendo released the Game Boy Color. It had a 2.32 inch color LCD display that was still not backlit. It had its own games that were made in color and was backward compatible to the original Game Boy games as well. Also in 1998, they released the Game Boy Light in Japan. This was a little larger than the Game Boy Pocket, but boasted for the first time an electroluminescent backlit screen. It used two AA batteries and was available in two colors, gold and silver. In 2001, Nintendo released the advanced version of the Game Boy that would be backward compatible with all previous games and have its own new library of games as well. This system was the Game Boy Advance. Through its life cycle, it had its own revisions, such as the Game Boy Advance SP and Game Boy Advance Micro. The original Game Boy architecture was finally discontinued in 2003, being launched in 1989, giving the system an amazing 14-year run and selling more than 118 million units, making it one of the most successful game consoles ever, either at home or portable. When you just
decide to step up to this kind of power, this kind of challenge, this kind of flying, crashing, feeling. When you decide to get serious, there's only one place to come, the games of Super Nintendo. No one else creates this kind of experience, because no one else creates these kinds of games. Now you're playing with power, super power. The story of the SNES starts in 1987. A newcomer to the gaming industry, NEC, had just released the 16-bit PC Engine in Japan. Nintendo's president, Hiroshi Yamamuchi, had seen NEC and its product as a strong competitor to the NES, which started to worry Nintendo. At this point, sales of the NES were still great, but Yamamuchi knew this would not last long with the great graphics and sound that the PC Engine was able to produce. Also in 1987, it was announced that Sega was about to launch their 16-bit system, the Mega Drive. In September of 1987, Nintendo announced the development of the Super Famicom and a new Super Mario Bros. 4 game. The system was being developed by none other than Masayuki Yumarara, who had developed the NES. Nintendo at this time was worried more about the NEC than Sega. The reason for this is that Sega had released a few consoles in the 8-bit era, but were completely overshadowed by the Famicom and the NES. Nintendo was really not in a hurry to develop the new 16-bit system because sales of the NES were still going good. However, this did not last long. Some feel Nintendo made this announcement in 1987 to stall sales of the PC Engine during the Christmas season. In 1988, Sega released the Mega Drive, and the PC Engine was picking up steam as well. NES sales started to slump, and Nintendo knew they had to get a new system on the market. Development went into full swing, but since Nintendo was so late to the game, it took a couple years to develop. The first prototypes of the system were shown to the public in 1988, and again before its launch in Japan in 1989. In 1989, both Sega and NEC had released their systems in North America, but changed the names to TurboGrafx-16 and the Sega Genesis. By the time the Super Famicom was ready to be launched, Sega was starting to take a lead in the gaming industry. With a good amount of games in its library, NEC was no slouch either. Nintendo, for the first time, had to deal with true competition. This marked one of the greatest console wars in history. Sega vs Nintendo. Nintendo released the Super Famicom in 1990 in Japan and it instantly sold out of the 300,000 units that were made. The system was then released in North America under the name Super Nintendo in 1991. Also around this time, Nintendo was aware of the CD add-on that Sega was about to release and wanted one for their own Super NES system so it could stay competitive. They had contracted out with Sony to develop the CD add-on named, you guessed it, the PlayStation. However, during the CES show in 1991, Nintendo reneged on their deal with Sony to produce it and went with Philips. Possibly one of the worst mistakes Nintendo ever made, birthing a monster in the gaming industry to this day, Sony's PlayStation. Philips went on to develop the CDI when Nintendo discontinued the CD add-on, but Philips still had a contract with Nintendo. This is why we have those weird CDI Zelda and Mario games like Hotel Mario and Zelda's Adventure. Once again, Nintendo had a lot of publishers developing for it, and unlike the Genesis, the games could be enhanced with special chips in the carts for sound and graphics. Also, it was capable of pseudo 3D graphics. During this time, sales of the system skyrocketed. As most older gamers used the Genesis, the younger gamers chose the SNES. This was all part of the console war. This is a strategy that worked to top Sega then, but would not work on future consoles, as it was shown by Sony's marketing of the PS1 to older gamers in the market, while Nintendo was still marketing to kids with the N64. The SNES went on to sell just under 50 million units worldwide, being launched in 1990 in Japan and finally being discontinued in the UK in 2005, giving this system an amazing 15 year lifespan, making it one of the longest lasting game systems to ever hit the market. Hey! You still don't have a Sega CD? 
What are you waiting for? Nintendo to make one? <laughs> you have seen the games, right? Uh, Wrong answer, man. Show them! <laughs> Want to see more? <laughs> Sega! The story of the Sega CD really starts in Japan in 1988. NEC was rumored to release a CD-ROM based system by the end of the year. Sega had just released the Sega Mega Drive in Japan to compete with the 16-bit PC Engine. But NEC was looking to step up the game with an add-on to the PC Engine called the PC Engine CD-ROM. Sega knew that the CD-ROM was the media of the future and decided to develop its own add-on CD-ROM system for the Sega Mega Drive. Sega did not have the capability to make its own CD-ROM system, so it partnered with JVC to help. Sega enlisted Tamio Tamaki to lead this project. Sega wanted a CD-ROM based system that could match or even outperform the PC Engine CD-ROM. They originally decided to double the amount of RAM that the NEC version had, but this was not enough. Rumors started to fly that NEC was developing a different, more powerful CD add-on that was to be called the Super CD-ROM that would have up to 512 kilobytes of RAM. Sega upped the ante and decided to put 6 megabits of RAM into this system. But that was not all. They also decided to add another Motorola 68000 CPU but clocked at 12.5 MHz, almost twice the speed of the Mega Drive CPU. On top of this, they added a custom GPU that could perform scaling and rotation effects. Also not to be outdone with audio, they included a custom Riot sound chip that was capable of producing 10 channels of sound of audio partnered with what the Mega Drive's YM2612 and SN76489 chips were providing for the system sound. The system would be able to play games, audio CDs, CDG video discs, and karaoke discs. The Mega CD was released in December of 1991 in Japan with only two games, Heavy Nova and Soul Feast. Other games released later that month included Nostalgia 1907, Ernest Evans, Funky Horror Band, and Tinka Fabu. But it wasn't until months later that games really started to hit the market. This led to sales in Japan being strong at first, but dying off quickly because the system really didn't have a great library at launch. During the development of the system, Sega was very protective of the technology that went into it. In fact, they were so secretive about it, they didn't even release a real version to Sega of America until it was almost too late. Sega of America had to procure its own ROM to put into the dummy unit to make it functional. To their dismay, the system had some major issues. The CD drive tray mechanism was flimsy and prone to break, but the worst issue was with the CD drive mech itself drawing too much current and releasing magic smoke from the system's capacitors. Rumor has it that the units actually caught on fire, but this is truly just a rumor. Only the caps blew, causing the system to smoke. The system was revised and released in North America as the Sega CD. When the Sega CD released in North America in October of 92, it was promised to have at least 20 games at launch, but Sega was not able to do this. It launched with four games. Unlike Japan, games started to be made right away, and by the end of the year there were 15 games published. Reception of the system is mixed. The system itself and the technology behind it was good, but the lack of games at launch time and the overuse of full motion video really didn't appeal to too many people. As time went on, the system never really caught on, but many great games were made for it. Also games like Night Trap and Lethal Enforcers were instrumental at the beginning of the ESRB ratings for video games due to their sexual and violent content. The Sega CD was released in Japan in 1991 and discontinued in 1996, giving the console a five-year lifespan. Although it seemed to be unpopular, it did sell over 2.2 million units with a total of 205 games being made. In my eyes, that's a pretty successful system for an add-on. How do you believe your system is the most advanced in the universe? Let's review the numbers. Sega Genesis is 16 bits, 3DO is 32 bits, the Atari Jaguar is 64 bits. Which is more advanced? Clifford! Hmm? 
16 and 32 are less than 64. So with 64 bits, 3D graphics, real world animation, and lightning speed that you can only get with Jaguar, which is more advanced! Can you repeat the question? Jaguar! 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 The story of the Atari Jaguar actually starts in the mid-1980s with four different companies, Atari, Commodore, Sinclair, and Flair Technologies. Commodore's longtime president, Jack Trammell, jumped ship from Commodore to Atari in 1984. At this point, Trammell focused on selling the existing inventory of Atari's products and creating a new line of computers capable of competing with Apple's Macintosh, the Atari ST. In the late 1980s, Trammell wanted to design a new series of video game consoles for Atari. This is where Sinclair and Flare Technology comes into play. Flare Technologies was part of Sinclair, and they started designing a new computer called the Loki. Unfortunately for Flare, the Loki didn't pan out and was cancelled. Flare Technologies was headed by Martin Brennan, Ben Cheese, and John Matheson. Flare started working with Amstrad and developed a system called the Flare One. The Flare One was intended to be a home computer or a video game console, but the chipset was actually used in countertop arcade game cabinets for trivia machines. Eventually, the chipset was further developed into the Kinect's multi-system prototype. This was also canceled, but caught the eye of Jack Trammell. In 1989, Jack Trammell contacted Flare Technologies and made a deal to buy Flare and make it a subsidiary of Atari, calling it Flare 2. Trammell asked them to create two game consoles, a 32-bit and a 64-bit one, using the Flare 2 technology that was used in the Kinect system. They started to work on both the 32-bit, codenamed the Panther, and the 64-bit, codenamed Jaguar consoles. Work on the Jaguar console proved to be going a lot faster, advancing further, leading to the Panther's cancellation. In 1993, the Jaguar was unveiled at the Chicago Consumer Electronics Show. Also, there was a test launch of the Jaguar, which saw all of the 20,000 units that were brought sold out. Atari at this point thought that they had a big hit on their hands. The Jaguar was launched on November 23, 1993 at a price of $249.99. Most of the games were not very popular, but there were a few good games. Tempest 2000, Doom, Wolfenstein 3D, and Alien vs. Predators were all released in 1993. As the consoles were starting to sell and people started buying and playing the games, one thing came to the forefront. Gamers realized the games didn't look like they were on a 64-bit system. Maybe 32-bit, but not quite 64-bit. Consumers started questioning whether the Jaguar was truly a 64-bit system. Because of this, Atari kind of limped along for a couple more years until 1995, with the arrival of the Sega Saturn and the Sony PlayStation sealing the final nail in the coffin for the Jaguar. But we'll take a quick pause here. I want to show you guys a few peripherals that were designed for the Jaguar. The first being the Pro Controller, giving you additional buttons and being designed for fighting games. Then there was the Jaglink, which was a network device to connect Jaguars together for multiplayer games. Then in 1995, they released the Jaguar CD and Memory Track Module. But unfortunately for Atari, this was not enough to save the Jaguar. By late 1995, rumors started circulating that the Jaguar was going to be discontinued in April of 1996, which it was. Then Atari agreed to merge with JTS Incorporated, and on July 30th of that year, the merger was completed. After the merger with JTS, most of the Jaguar inventory remained unsold and was moved to a private liquidator called Tiger Software in 1996. In 1998, JTS sold the Atari name and all of its Atari properties to Hasbro. But here's some interesting information about Atari and JTS. They ended up selling the console shells to a dental imaging company, which produced an imaging machine using the shells of the Atari Jaguar. Unfortunately, only a few were produced as the technology changed and the company used different products. So that brings us to the end of the Atari Jaguar story. However, it never truly died. In 1998, the Jaguar became an open source system and many great homebrew games have been made for it. In fact, the homebrew games tend to be a little bit better than the original Jaguar games that were released by Atari. So if you ever have a chance to check out the homebrew scene on the Jaguar, it's excellent. The Jaguar did not have a very long lifespan. It started in 1993 and was discontinued in 1996, 
selling less than 150,000 units in total, and being the very last video game console made by Atari. Well, at least the Atari that we all grew up with. The machine has appeared in homes across America. Double and redouble his power. 32. Six times more powerful than 3DO. Alright, baby. 40 times more than Super NES. Hey, yo, there is no 32-bit Super NES. Are we going to see the games or what? Show them! Increase the power Thank you. The story of the 32X started in January of 1994. Sega president Hayoko Nakayama was worried about the Atari Jaguar that was released in November of 93, taking a share of the gaming market away from Sega. This was due to the fact that Sega was already working on Project Saturn, but it was not scheduled to be released until late 1994 in Japan and mid-1995 in North America. He was so worried that during the CES show he called Joe Miller, head of Sega of America's R&D department, and conferenced in Sega of America's producer, Scott Bayless, Sega of America's Vice President of Technology, Marty France, and Sega Hardware Team, Hideki Sato, advising them of developing a quick response to the Jaguar. After the phone call, Sega of America CEO, Tom Kalansky, argued that they could get another year of life out of the Genesis without the need of another system. Sega of Japan disagreed and wanted a whole new system design. This started the development of Project Jupiter, a whole new system based off the Genesis. This new system would have been a 32-bit system with an upgraded color palette and some 3D capabilities. But Miller disagreed with this idea, stating that if you're just going to upgrade the same system, you might as well just make an add-on for it. Sega of Japan and America compromised, and another add-on was made for the Genesis. They discontinued Project Jupiter and started Project Mars. The Sega of America team headed the Mars project. They designed it to use two of the 32-bit Super H2 Hitachi CPUs that were developed in 1993 jointly with Sega for use in the Saturn. But for this project, the clock speed was reduced. The system would be able to use the Sega Genesis CPU, GPU, and sound chips. If you had the Sega CD, it could use its hardware as well. Although only five games were released in a CD format that used the Genesis, Sega CD, and 32X's hardware altogether. Although the system's design was more powerful than originally conceived using the Saturn's processors, it was not going to be compatible with the Saturn, being its own system. The system was marketed to people who wanted to get into the 32-bit gaming market but couldn't afford the upcoming Saturn. It was also seen as a transitional device between the 16-bit Genesis and the 32-bit Saturn. The 32X was released in November of 1994 in North America for $159 at the same time the Saturn was being released in Japan. Sales in the unit were initially strong. Over 1 million units were ordered, but Sega was only able to produce 600,000 units by the end of 1994 due to the shortage of CPUs being used in the Saturn as well. By Christmas of 94, 500,000 units were already sold, exceeding Sega's expectations. Six games were available at launch at the price of $69.99 apiece. It didn't take long for consumers to see that the system was not as good as the hype around it. Development of the system was difficult, making it hard for Sega to secure publishers for games. Most publishers wanted to make games for the upcoming Saturn and not this transitional system. Sega sent out development kits, but by this time, it was too late. Game publishers bailed on the 32X, with only a total of 40 games being made for the system, most being rushed out and not being completed. Sega was impressed with the sales figures early in the release. They started development of another system, the Sega Neptune. This was to be a Sega Genesis and 32X in one console, but soon after this, the media was starting to be very critical about Sega's strategy. Word got out about the games and the price point, and sales started to plummet. Several of the publishers for the 32X, such as Capcom and Konami, bailed at this point. This was the beginning of the end for the 32X. By mid-1995, it was clear to Sega that the 32X was not going to be successful, and they ordered Sega of America to concentrate its efforts on the Saturn. 
By September of 95, the price of the units were decreased to $99. By 1996, the system was discontinued and a fire sale started. Trying to clear out the remaining inventory, selling the units for $19.99 apiece. Sega had made the same mistake Atari had made, competing with itself. Also, the fact that the system was difficult to develop games for, the publishers bailed, and the price was just too high for an add-on, led to the death of the system. In the process, they lost consumer confidence as consumers saw the 32X as just a greedy money grab between the Genesis and the Saturn. That brings us to the end of the 32X. It had a very short two-year lifespan, starting in 1994 and being discontinued in 1996, with just over 800,000 units being sold, making it Sega's worst commercial failure. We are five years away from entering the 21st century. Humankind stands on the edge of the interactive age. You have come a long way. But are you ready for the future? Introducing Sega Saturn. Aww. Hit it! Sega's next generation gaming platform. Revolutionary sports and arcade gameplay. All with amazing new 3D experiences never before possible on home game systems. Wow. Sega Saturn. It's how you play the game. farther than you have ever gone before. Sega Saturn. Play your games in the 21st century and leave the rest of the world behind. <laughs> The story of the Sega Saturn starts in 1992. Sega knew they had to come up with the next-gen video game console to stay competitive in the gaming market. Sega's Haduki Soto headed the development team of the new console codename Project Saturn. By 1993, Sega teamed up with Hitachi to develop a new 32-bit RISC CPU that would be used in the new console. The new processor would be called the Super H RISC Engine, or SH2 for short. The Saturn would be developed around the dual SH2 configuration. Sega was mostly finished with the design of the Saturn by the end of 1993, but info was leaked about the upcoming Sony PlayStation, and Sega decided to add another video display processor to the Saturn to improve 2D performance and 3D texturing too. This gave the Saturn two VDPs as well. During this time frame, Tom Kalaksky didn't like the architecture of the Saturn and wanted to go with supercomputer maker Silicon Graphics for its 3D chips and design. Sega of Japan didn't like this idea. Nintendo later contracted with Silicon Graphics for the development of the N64. Also in 1993, Sega restructured its internal game studios to better suit development of 3D games. They enlisted Team Andromeda, which were part of the arcade development team, to design 3D games for the new console. In early 1994, the Sega Titan arcade system came to be based off the Saturn's architecture, a claim being the developer for it in the United States. In early 1994, per orders of Sega of Japan, Sega of America started development of the 32-bit add-on for the Sega Genesis called the 32X. This was to be a transitional device between the Genesis and the Saturn, for people who could not afford the upcoming Saturn. It would use much of the same hardware as the Saturn, such as the SH2 CPUs, but would be incompatible. Sega of America president Tom Kalaski did not like the idea of the 32X, wanting to instead get at least another year of life out of the Genesis with no more add-ons. He just saw it as a bad idea, but Sega continued on with the development of the two 32-bit systems that would launch at the same time in 1994. 
the Saturn in Japan, and the 32X in North America. The Saturn released in November of 1994 in Japan with the pack-in game of Virtual Fighter. The initial 200,000 units were sold out in the first day. Sega waited to release more units to the market until December 3, 1994, the day the PlayStation released in Japan to stymie their sales. By the time 1994 was over, Sega had sold more than 500,000 units while the PlayStation had only sold 300,000 units. This did not last long though, as the sales of the PS1 took off in 1995, leaving the Saturn behind. Sony started to attract more third-party developers due to the cheap licensing fee of only $10 and a well-designed development kit. In March of 1995, Kalansky announced the Saturn would be launched September 2nd in the United States. However, Sega of Japan wanted the console to be released earlier. During the E3 show on May the 11th, Kalansky announced the release of the Saturn for the price of $399. 30,000 units were shipped out to Toys R Us, Babbage's, Electronics Boutique, and Software Etc. and available for sale that day. This enraged other retailers that were not advised of the release. Stores such as Best Buy, Walmart, and KB Toys stopped selling Sega products because of this. During the E3 show, PlayStation announced they would release their console at a price of $299 to the applause of the crowd. For some of you uh, might actually want to know what that price is. Uh, and uh, since it's a beautiful day here in Los Angeles, uh, I'm going to ask Sony Computer Entertainment President of America, Steve Race, to join me for a brief presentation. All this started to make Sega look bad. With its release in the US, only six games were ready with the pack-in game Virtual Fighter. This game was not as popular in the United States as it was in Japan, making more people wait for the PlayStation release. People started to compare games such as Daytona USA vs Ridge Racer on the PlayStation. There was a noticeable difference with Ridge Racer being almost arcade quality, while Daytona USA was just not as good as the arcade. In October, Sega announced a price reduction of the Saturn to $299, the same as the PlayStation. However, not to be outdone, Sony announced in May of 1996 another price reduction to $199. The next day, Sega announced their price reduction to the same amount as the PlayStation's, but for Sega, they were now losing money on each console they sold. By 1995, Sega still accounted for 40% of the US gaming market, but with the arrival of the PlayStation, things were taking a dramatic swing. By 1996, Kalansky, which wanted to just continue on with the Genesis until the launch of the Saturn, wanted out of Sega. He left in September of 1996, and that started a shakeup at Sega of America. Several people either quit or moved positions as Sega of America was being reformed. Also in 1996, Sega of America STI team was developing a new 3D Sonic game for the 32X, but since the 32X was being discontinued, it was now to be released on the Saturn. The game was to be called Sonic Extreme, and to be a fully immersive 3D world, a first for a Sonic game. The game was being rushed to be completed by December of 1996, However, the lead programmer quit and several of the other team members got sick and it was apparent that the game would not be completed by December. Sega cancelled the game. Not long after this, the STI team was disbanded. With the cancellation of Sonic Extreme, a lack of third-party developers being harder to develop for and retailers refusing to sell Sega products were all nails in the Saturn's coffin. Sony had taken the lead in the market share for gaming consoles in the US, leaving Sega behind. By 1997, Sony had 47%, Nintendo 40%, and Sega only 12% of the gaming market. By 1998, Sega was almost ready to release the next game console. With sales of the Saturn not doing well in the US and Europe, they decided to call it quits on the Saturn in those regions. It did continue on in Japan for a couple more years until the year 2000 when it was cancelled there too. 
The Sega Saturn had a six-year lifespan, being released in Japan in 1994 and discontinued in the year 2000, selling 9.26 million units worldwide. The console is considered to be a failure by Sega due to the early release in the US, not enough games at launch, and disagreements internally at Sega leading to bad business decisions. Are we enjoying ourselves today, folks? Well, if drinking white wine out of a four-ounce glass is your idea of enjoyment, see, it's white wine in a three-ounce glass, red in a four. Hey, you and the goatee! Two words for you, pal. Lighten up! Frenchy, I need an extension cord to Buffalo Wings. Go. Au revoir. Raising the roof with the coot. How you doing? Who's bored? Raise your hand. Anybody? <laughs> Look who's happy now! PlayStation. The story of the PlayStation starts with Ken Kutengari, or better known as the father of the PlayStation. Kutengari worked behind the scenes with Nintendo to strike a deal to use the SPC-700 sound processor in the new Super Nintendo Entertainment System. Sony executives found out about this and almost fired him over it, but they decided to keep him on as a protege because the deal was just so damn successful. This started a working relationship with Nintendo. Nintendo decided to contract Sony out to build a CD add-on system for the Super Nintendo. Sony was very eager to get into the gaming market because they saw the profit that was being made by Nintendo and Sega at the time. So to secure maximum profits after they developed the SNES CD, or codename PlayStation, Sony was demanding all rights to the games being made on the new CD add-on. This would also transfer over to the Super Nintendo cartridges if they were being used in conjunction with the CD system. Three years had went by and it was 1991. At the CES show, Nintendo was showing their partnership with Sony to create the CD add-on system. Nintendo actually made this announcement, but afterwards struck a deal with Philips to make the CD add-on system for Nintendo. The next day at the CES show, this deal was announced. Folks in the gaming industry were just shocked by the news as Sony and Nintendo's partnership had been going on for over three years at this point. It was a total betrayal on Nintendo's part. But Nintendo did not want to lose control over the licensing of their games to another company. Sony continued to work with Nintendo to supply them the chips for the Super Nintendo system. But really after this, there was no more business done between the two companies. And by this time, Sony had developed a standalone version of the PlayStation which was capable of playing Super Nintendo cartridges. Nintendo would allow Sony to launch the system if they wanted, but Sony actually decided against it. The Sony suits were rethinking their business model on video games. They were really thinking about pulling out of the video game market altogether. But with successful shifting of certain divisions like the music division and creating the Sony Computer Entertainment division, they started developing a new PlayStation console. The new console would have better graphic capabilities, such as Polygon 3D graphics. Sony really wanted to distance the new console from the failed attempt that they had with Nintendo. The project was called PlayStation X, or PSX. In 1993, Sony decided to go to several gaming companies to try to promote their new system. Sony at this time didn't have any in-house development, so they had to rely on third-party developers for their games. The technical details of the PlayStation, or how easy it was to develop for, made it an easy decision for developers to jump on board with Sony, including Namco, Konami, and Williams. But Sony needed to have its own in-house development team too. So in 1993, Sony acquired Psygnosis, and I know all you Amiga guys out there know who Psygnosis is. Psygnosis was later renamed to SCE Liverpool. Once Sony purchased Psygnosis, they had a team of over 500 people developing games for them. Although the system was easy to develop for, the development system that Sony had created was not easy, and folks at Psygnosis did not like it. They wanted something that was PC-based and be like something that they were used to and be familiar developing on. So Sony teamed up with a company named SN Systems, and they developed the cards and software for the development system. Now there was PC interconnectivity and the ability to program and compile in GCC, which made development very easy. The PlayStation launched in Japan on December 3, 1994, and in North America on September 9, 1995, and then in Europe on September 29, 1995. 
During and after the launch of the PlayStation, Sony tried a different marketing strategy than any other video game manufacturer had tried before, except for Sega. Instead of marketing its game console for kids, it marketed it towards adults and older teenagers. Sony's logic to this was sound. Seeing that a generation of gamers, Generation X, that grew up with Atari and Nintendo were now adults and had expendable cash, and by marketing their console for the older gamer and not being toyish like Nintendo, adults had cash in hand and were ready to go pay for a new game system, while, well, you know, children didn't. And it made the sales of the PlayStation skyrocket. The PlayStation had several different models, most of which looked the same, but in the year 2000, Sony launched the PS1 as a cost-reduced, smaller version of the console. It actually outsold the PlayStation 2 for the first two years after its launch. The PlayStation enjoyed a successful 12-year run, with it being discontinued in 2006 and with more than 102 million units sold. It came from the third dimension, with its own brain, its own voice, its own legs. There's only one problem. It needs your eyes. Virtual Boy. See it now in 3D. The story of the Nintendo Virtual Boy actually starts in the mid-1980s with a company named Reflection Technology Incorporated. They created a stereoscopic head-tracking prototype called the Private Eye, which featured a tank game. Needing funds to support their business ambitions, they went to the Consumer Electronics Show. There they showed the Private Eye prototype off to several companies including Mattel, Sega, and Hasbro. All those companies declined, but one company in particular showed interest in the Private Eye prototype, and that was Nintendo. Gunpai Yokoi, which was the inventor of the Game & Watch and Game Boy, led the engineering R&D1 group of Nintendo. He thought the oscillating mirror display technology in the private eye was cutting edge. Negotiations started, and Nintendo came to a licensing agreement with Reflections Technology to use their display technology in a new game console. After years of development, the head tracking technology was dropped due to the possibility of health issues for the people using it. But Nintendo kept the oscillating mirror stereoscopic display technology. After several different colors and a full color display was tested, it was found that the red and black screen was cheaper to produce and easier on the eyes for the user. Nintendo predicted the console to be a big seller, even opening a new factory in China specifically for the production of the Virtual Boy. They predicted over 3 million units sold over Christmas time, and over 16 million units of software sold by that time as well. It debuted at the 1995 E3 and the CES shows but already the reviews were starting to look bad. Many people at the shows had tried out the new console and complained of headaches and eye strain. The Virtual Boy was released in Japan on July 21st, 1995 and in North America on August 6th, 1995 at a price of $179.95. There were four launch games that coincided with its release, Mario Tennis, Red Alarm, Telero Boxer, and Galactic Pinball. After its release, there were several complaints from parents about headaches and eye strain from children. Even though the console warned users to take breaks, kids just didn't listen. Imagine that. Sales of the console plummeted. Nintendo tried dire promotions to show off the 3D capabilities as opposed to 2D consoles, but this marketing tactic failed as well. After the Christmas season in 1995 and the slow sales of the Virtual Boy, Nintendo decided to discontinue the production of the console and games. I'm not really sure the exact date of when it was discontinued, but I believe it had an 11-month lifespan. This was Nintendo's worst console failure, selling only 770,000 units in total. Is it here yet? No. Is it here yet? Nope. Is it here yet? No. Is it here yet? No. Is it here yet? No. Is it here yet? Let me check. No. Is it here yet? Pokemon Stadium 2 will be here on March 28th. Until then, $10 reserves your copy and gets you a collector's edition poster with tons of Pokemon. So you'll be ready to battle with your gold and silver characters in 3D. Cool. Is it here yet? No. Is Rated E for yet? everyone. The story of the N64 really starts in the early 1990s. 
At this point, Nintendo knew that they needed to start development of a new system to replace the Super Nintendo and enter into the next generation of consoles. This is where Silicon Graphics Incorporated, a graphics visualization and supercomputing company comes into the picture. SGI was looking to expand their company by putting some of their technology into consumer products. Jim Clark, founder of SGI, contacted Sega of America and spoke with Tom Kalansky. Kalansky was impressed with what he saw, but ultimately Sega decided not to buy the technology. After Sega engineers evaluated the hardware and technology, they found several issues with it and offered to buy it outright from SGI. But SGI was not willing to give up the rights to its own technology. After no deal was struck with Sega, Clark then spoke with president of Nintendo, Hiroshi Yamamuchi, in early 1993. Nintendo was willing to license the chipset instead of owning it outright, and on August 23, 1993, Nintendo and SGI came to an agreement initiating what would be called Project Reality. The technology from Project Reality was to be used in the arcades as soon as 1994 and in the home console market by 1995. Reality Emergent Technology is the name SGI had given its components used in the Project Reality. Initially, Project Reality was developed into the Onyx supercomputer, costing $100,000 to $250,000. The game development system was filled with Reality Engine 2 graphics boards and four 150MHz RISC CPUs. The APIs were based on Performer and OpenGPL. On June 23, 1994, Nintendo announced the official name of its console as the Ultra 64. Developers started signing on with Nintendo, including Rare, Acclaim, DMA Designs, Ocean, and many more. Around this time, the Project Reality team prototyped a game controller for the system. They used the design cues from the SNES controller and added an analog stick with a Z button. This prototype controller eventually became the N64 controller. The design of this controller was so secretive that once developers were done using it, they had to hide it in a lockbox. While development of the console continued, Nintendo and developers started developing games on the Onyx supercomputer-based development system. Eventually, these systems were replaced by cost-reduced SGI Indie workstations, which had fully accurate console simulation boards within the system to help with the ease of development. The console was publicly revealed for the first time in 1994, and showed the console with the Nintendo Ultra 64 logo, a ROM cartridge, but still no controller at the time. In late 1994, Nintendo started licensing agreements with Midway and Williams to create arcade games based on the Ultra 64. These games were Killer Instinct and Cruising USA. Although the Ultra 64 arcade boards were based on the Ultra 64 game console, they used a different chipset with no reality coprocessor and used hard drives. Also around this time, Nintendo decided to go ahead and rename the game console from the Ultra 64 to the Nintendo 64. This decision was based on Konami, who had ownership of the Ultra Games trademark. Nintendo was afraid they might be sued over trademark infringement, so the name was changed to the Nintendo 64, or better known as the N64. A cool tidbit of information is that the software and the hardware on the N64 still use the NUS prefix, which stands for Nintendo Ultra 64. Originally, the N64 was slated to be released by the Christmas season of 1995. However, due to hardware problems with the chips underperforming, they had to be redesigned again. The delay went on until the spring of 1996. The Nintendo Software Development Kit was completely redesigned as a Windows-based partner N64 system by Kyoto Microcomputers. On June 23, 1996, the N64 was released in Japan and on September 26, 1996, released in North America. The console was originally slated to be sold in the US for $250, but the launch price was reduced down to $199.99 to make it competitive with Sony and Sega. Nintendo at this point knew that Sony and Sega had basically sewed up the adult and teen market in video games, so the N64 specifically targeted preteens. The N64 was quite a successful console, selling just under 33 million units worldwide. It was eventually discontinued on April 30th, 2002, this gave the N64 a six-year lifespan. Son 
Hi, Randy. Well, hello. It's the story of the Sega Dreamcast starts in 1995. Sega was already looking into their new console. It had been reported that they held meetings with several companies to help in the development, such as Lockheed Martin and 3DO, to name a couple. With the release of the Sega Saturn in 1994, and all the issues surrounding it, such as it being hard to develop for, lack of third-party developers, and issues with U.S. retailers selling Sega products, all had Sega looking for a way out of the Saturn as financial losses were starting to take a toll. By 1996, longtime president of Sega of America, Tom Kalatsky, had resigned his position and was replaced by Shoichiro Irimajari, and Bernie Stoller became Sega of America's vice president in charge of product development and third-party relations. With the release of the PlayStation and in 1996 the release of the N64, Sega saw sales dwindle. By late 1997, Sega only held on to only 12% of the game console market, with Nintendo being at 40% and Sony at 47%. Due to Sega performing so poorly, Sega president Hayao Nakayama, which had been president of Sega since 1983, stepped down. Iru Majari took over the position with Stoller becoming CEO of Sega of America. At this point, Sega discontinued the Saturn. By 1998, Sega had reported its first consolidated financial loss since 1988 on the Tokyo Stock Exchange. It reported a $269.9 million loss. Now back in 1997, Irumajari hired on IBM's Tatsuo Yamamoto to head on an 11-person team to work on a top-secret project called Black Belt. Also during this time, Sega's Hiduki Soto had also started development of a new console. Reports vary whether or not Iribanjari had started the two-team development or if Sato started it on his own. Sato's group decided to go with Hitachi's SH4 processor with the video logic power VR2 graphics processor by NEC. This project was named White Belt, then changed to Doral, named after the female fighter in the Virtual Fighter game series. Yamamoto's team decided to go in another direction. They decided to go with the 3DFX Voodoo 2 and Voodoo Banshee GPUs and a Motorola PowerPC 600E CPU. Sega's management ultimately decided to go with Sato's design using the SH4 and PowerVR architecture. This decision was thought to have been made because of Sega's relationship with NEC being a Japanese company. Stoller didn't like the idea of the use of the PowerVR GPU and wanted to use the 3DFX GPU, but Sega of Japan ultimately decided to go with the PowerVR which led to a lawsuit by 3DFX against Sega for breach of contract and was settled out of court with an undisclosed amount paid out to 3DFX. At this time, the project was renamed again to Project Katana. Also during this time, EA Games was not happy with Sega's decision to go with the PowerVR GPU either. They didn't really know how to program for it, instead wanting Sega to go with the 3DFX. Also, EA wanted an exclusive contract for sports games, which Sega didn't want to do. Because of this decision, no EA games would be available on the Dreamcast, and Sega went on to produce their own sports games along with developer Visual Concepts, which headed the 2K Sports Game series. Sega touted the system to be easy to develop for, unlike their previous system, the Saturn, so easy, in fact, that you could make a game that would run on a Pentium 2 200 PC and easily port it over to the new system. Microsoft developed a custom version of Windows CE that ran on the system using DirectX's APIs and dynamic leak libraries, making it really easy to port over PC games. Sega also made their own OS to be used in the development of games for the system, with most developers going with it instead of Microsoft's OS as it had greater performance capabilities. The Katana project was revealed on May 21, 1998 in Tokyo, 
and Sega held a public naming competition for the new system. Over 5,000 names were submitted, with Dreamcast being the chosen one, thought up by developer Kinji Uno. The name is a combination of the words dream and broadcast. It is said that Sega spent $80 million on hardware development, up to $200 million on software development, and $3 million on promotions and advertisements worldwide getting it ready for launch. The Dreamcast was launched in Japan on November 27, 1998 for the price of 29,000 yen, with four games available at launch. Within one day, they had sold out of the entire inventory of Dreamcast. Sega at this point hoped to sell more than 1 million units by February of 1999, but only sold 900,000 units falling short of the mark. Because of this, and the fact that Sony had just leaked info about the upcoming PS2, Sega lowered the price of the unit to 19,900 yen, which helped give Sega 17% of the console market by late 1999. In August of 1999, Stoller had been fired and Peter Moore had took over his position. The Dreamcast launched on September 9, 1999 in North America with 18 games available for the price of $199.99. But Sega had started thinking about the American market and started a contract with Hollywood Video to rent the console out before the launch date, giving people a sneak peek at the console before it actually launched. Sega also repaired its relationships with the American retailers that stopped selling Sega products after the early release of the Saturn. Sega hit a sales record, selling more than 255,000 units in the first 24 hours. By November, Sega had announced that they had sold over 1 million units. Things were looking good for the Dreamcast. But as the launch of the PS2 was coming and more info about it was coming out, sales of the Dreamcast started to slow down. The PS2's GPU is much more powerful, but the thing that kept people from buying the Dreamcast was the fact that the PS2 would be able to play DVDs and have games on DVD giving games much more space for programs and making bigger and better games. Also, Nintendo announced their next upcoming console, the GameCube, and Microsoft started development of the Xbox. Sales of the Dreamcast dwindled, and Sega reported a net loss of $404 million by March of 2000. Moore had said for the Dreamcast to be viable, it would have to sell 5 million units by the end of the year. Unfortunately, it only sold 3 million, leaving Sega with another loss of 163 million, and by March of 2001, it went over $417 million in losses. On May 22, 2000, Sega chairman Asio Akawa replaced Irujimarmi as president of Sega. He had always wanted Sega to get out of the hardware market and become just a developer. In September of 2000, Sega held a board meeting and agreed at this point to leave the console market. On January 31st, 2001, it was announced that the Dreamcast was to be canceled in March, and Sega reduced the price of the unit to $99 to get rid of the remaining inventory. The price was reduced two more times to $79 and then $49. This marked the end of Sega becoming a console manufacturer. It also marked the end of an era, and the Dreamcast. The Dreamcast was officially canceled on March 31st, 2001. So that brings us to the end of the Dreamcast story. With the console launching in 1998 in Japan and being discontinued worldwide in 2001, gave the system a short three-year lifespan, selling over 9 million units in total and being Sega's last video game console. The story of the PlayStation 2 starts shortly after the launch of the original PlayStation in 1994. 
Ken Kutengari, the father of the PlayStation, already saw the need to start developing the next generation of system to stay ahead of the competition. Sony wanted to develop a new system that would not only play the new generation of games, but also be fully backward compatible to the original PlayStation. The only system that had accomplished that up until this point was the Atari 7800, being fully backward compatible to the 2600. Also, development of the graphics rendering chip would be designed in-house. However, Sony wanted to see their options in case their chip didn't work out. They worked with a few different companies to design a new graphics rendering chip. The most popular of these companies was Argonaut Games, which had been working with Nintendo since the NES days, and had created the Super FX chip for use in the SNES system. After several designs were submitted, Sony decided to go with their own in-house design, which became the Graphics Synthesizer chip. With help of Toshiba, Sony also designed the CPU for the system called the Emotion Engine. Work continued on the development through the mid-90s. Sony ultimately decided to put a new technology into the system, the newly designed DVD-ROM drive. This would not only allow the user to view DVDs, but also have games on DVD format which would increase the amount of space for games on the disc by tenfold, making better quality games with amazing graphic capabilities. To top it off, Sony also decided to make the system able to connect to the internet via a 56K modem or high-speed broadband, and to have a hard drive for games that would support it. This would be accomplished with an add-on accessory that mounted on the back of the PS2 via the expansion slot called the PS2 Network Adapter. The design of the PS2 case was inspired by Atari. Ken Kuntgari was a fan of Atari and wanted something in the design that would bring back the nostalgic feeling from the old school Atari systems. He wanted to design a system with fins like the original 2600, but it seems Sony took it a step further. Towards the end of the Atari's computer life cycle, they were going to release a new ST computer named the Falcon Microbox. However, this was canceled as the company went into bankruptcy and never saw the light of day. The case design, however, looked eerily familiar to the case that was designed for the PS2. The two systems look almost identical besides their color. By mid-1997, info was leaked to the press about the new system and its features such as having a DVD-ROM drive and being backwards compatible to the PS1. However, Sony denied that they were working on a new system at all. It was almost a full two years after this, in March of 1999, that Sony officially announced that they were making a new PlayStation and told the world about its features. In September of 1999, Sega released the Dreamcast. It had a successful launch, selling more than 500,000 units in the first two weeks. Sony unveiled a new PS2 at the Tokyo Game Show on September 20th. Two games were shown, the new Gran Turismo and Tekken Tag Tournament, to the amazement of the crowd. Once info about the new PlayStation came out, gamers were hesitant to buy the Dreamcast because the PS2 would have a DVD-ROM drive, which at the time was a huge selling point. The PS2 launched in March of 2000 in Japan, October in North America, and November in Europe. The launch was wildly successful. Sony sold more than 1.4 million units by the end of March in Japan, selling out of its entire inventory. More units were made for the North American and European launch, but they too were soon sold out. This led to the first time a video game system was being sold on eBay for several times the amount of the actual MSRP. Production of the system ramped up and eventually there were ample supplies of the PS2. Also Sony made better dev systems for third party developers, making it easier for them to program games for the system. This coupled with the fact that the entire PS2 system was selling for equal or less than a standalone DVD player, this was a game changer at the time. Sales of the system soared. By the end of 2000, Sony had created such a financial nightmare for Sega, they decided to pull the plug on the Dreamcast and console production altogether by March of 2001. Although Sega was no longer a competitor, two new video game systems were released in 2001 the Nintendo GameCube, and Microsoft's Xbox, both of which were more powerful than the PS2, but the GameCube lacked DVD playback and the Xbox needed an add-on remote control sensor to make DVD playback possible. This made the PS2 the go-to system if you wanted the ability to play DVDs as well as games. Also with its ability to play PS1 games, made it the most popular system of the generation. They also secured exclusive licenses for games such as Grand Theft Auto and Metal Gear making the system even more sought after. 
The PS2 really didn't get into online gaming until the launch of Microsoft's Xbox Live. Sony knew they had to get into the online realm to stay competitive. Unlike Microsoft that controlled the servers that the games were hosted on, Sony made the developer of the game run the servers for their games on the PS2. This kept playing online free to the player unlike Xbox Live, which was a paid service. This made the PS2 more tempting to people who wanted to play online and on the cheap. During the PS2 production, Sony released another unique PS2 system called the PSX in Japan in 2003. It was a PS2 with a built-in DVR. It had up to a 250 gigabyte hard drive installed to record TV from either VHF or a cable tuner. It was also the first PlayStation to use Sony's XMB or Cross Media Bar graphics user interface that the PSP and the PS3 eventually had. By the end of 2003, the PS2 was a hit, already selling millions of units over what the competition was selling. They wanted to make more profit, so they followed what Atari had done years before and started the design of a cost-reduced version of the PS2. In September of 2004, Sony released the PS2 Slim, a much smaller PS2 that included a top-loading drive, no hard drive support, and had a built-in modem. Also by this time, hacking the system was becoming popular with mod chips, and the new Slim version implemented protections against known mod chips at the time. The PS2 continued to be produced until 2013, when it was finally discontinued worldwide. The last game, Pro Evolution Soccer 2014, being released on November 8, 2013 in the UK. The PS2 launched in 2000 and was discontinued in 2013, giving the system a 13-year lifespan and selling over 155 million units, making it the best-selling video game console ever produced to this day and bringing the DVD format to homes worldwide. Nintendo GameCube. The story of the Nintendo GameCube starts in 1996. The N64 had just launched and Nintendo started development of a new console they named the N2000. In 1997, a new company called ArtX was created as a spin-off of SGI, the company that helped Nintendo develop the N64. As many as 20 engineers from SGI came to ArtX and was led by Wee Yin, who was head of Nintendo operations for SGI and led Project Reality that eventually became the N64. Starting in May of 1998, ArtX partnered with Nintendo to design the system logic and graphics processor for the new console. The GPU was codenamed Flipper. Also around this time, Nintendo partnered with IBM to create the CPU for the system codenamed Gecko and with Panasonic to create the system drive mechanism. The name of the project was changed from N2000 to StarCube, then Nintendo advanced during this time. In May of 1999, the console was first announced with another new codename, Project Dolphin. After this, Nintendo started supplying development kits to third-party developers. In April of 2000, Artex was acquired by ATI. Although the Flipper GPU was already finished by Artex, this is why the ATI logo is on the front of the GameCube. It was at this time that ATI stated that they are now a major supplier of graphics chips for the game console market and boasted about how they were the top of the hill with their 128-bit architecture. 
Also in development at this time was a motion controller that was supposed to be used with the system. Nintendo had patented this idea. Unfortunately, the final design was not ready for the launch of the console, and it was postponed until their next console, the Wii. A lot of the games that were being developed for the N64 were postponed and ported over to the Dolphin as launch titles. The last first party game released on the N64 was in May of 2001, six months before the launch of the Dolphin. It was also at this time that the console name was changed to the GameCube. On May 21st, 2001, it was revealed at A3 at a price of $199.99, which was $100 less than either the PS2 or the Xbox. The GameCube launched in Japan on September 14th, 2001, and in North America on November 18th, 2001. In Japan, 300,000 of the 450,000 units that were made sold in the first three days, and in North America, over 600,000 units were sold by December of 2001. Nintendo thought they had a hit on their hands. They had predicted 50 million units sold by 2005, but this was not the case. Only 22 million were sold by that time. But because of the lack of a true DVD player, like its competition, the games marketed towards kids and most older gamers seeing it as toyish, it did not do well competing with the Xbox and the PS2. In fact, it is the third worst selling Nintendo console with only the Virtual Boy and the Wii U being worse sellers. With the Wii being launched in 2006, Nintendo announced that the GameCube would be discontinued in February of 2007. The last official game, Madden NFL 2008, being released on August 14th, 2007. The Nintendo GameCube had a six-year lifespan from 2001 to 2007 selling over 22 million units and being Nintendo's third worst selling console. The story of the Xbox starts in the late 1990s. Microsoft had found success in the PC gaming market, with titles such as Flight Simulator and Age of Empires using the DirectX API. They saw the success Sony was having with the PlayStation and wanted in on the action. Sony had announced the upcoming console the PlayStation 2 and discussed how the game console would take over the PC market in the next few years for games and internet connectivity. This worried Bill Gates as he saw it as direct competition to Microsoft's PC home market. Sega had worked with Microsoft and used a version of Windows CE to develop games on the Dreamcast. Microsoft contacted Sony to try to work a deal with them to develop the software to program games on the PS2 just as they had done with Sega. Sony refused the offer, deciding to develop their own dev system. Bill Gates now wanted to get into the game console market to directly compete with Sony. Gates contacted Hiroshi Yamamuchi to try to acquire Nintendo, which Yamamuchi adamantly declined. Around this time, four Microsoft DirectX engineers, Kevin Bacchus, Seamus Blackley, Ed Hayes, and Otto Burkays, they started discussing ideas for a new game console that would work off the DirectX technology. The project was codenamed Midway to represent the Japanese defeat to American forces at Midway Island during World War II 
showing Microsoft's ambition to defeat Sony in the console market. In March of 1999, the DirectX team had their first development meeting about the new console. They decided it should run off a dumbed-down version of Windows 2000 and DirectX 8.1. They wanted it built from PC parts to make it even easier to port games over from the PC to the new console. Microsoft had acquired WebTV and had put it on the team to develop the new console as well. The DirectX team and the WebTV team just didn't agree on what the console should be. The WebTV group wanted it to run off Windows CE and the hardware to be created from the ground up instead of using PC hardware. This came to a head in a meeting of May of 1999. Both teams pitched their idea. The DirectX team emphasized the use of PC hardware, a hard drive, and an Ethernet port for internet connectivity, while the Web TV group wanted a system designed from the ground up using dial-up internet. Gates ultimately decided to go with the DirectX team's idea, mainly because of its use of broadband internet for the upcoming Xbox Live. Microsoft initially wanted the third party to manufacture the consoles, but after more research was done, this was not going to be feasible and they would have to manufacture the consoles themselves. That drove the cost up more than they wanted. Bill Gates was furious about this, but after being reminded that he was going to be competing with the top dog in the industry, Sony, Gates decided to move forward with the project, no matter the cost. They began prototyping the console using Dell computer parts and an AMD processor, but in the final design, an Intel processor was used instead without AMD's knowledge. In the year 2000, they were coming up with a name for the console. They wanted it to show the use of DirectX. Several names were thrown around including Direct Xbox, XX Xbox, Direct XX Xbox. The Direct Xbox name was shortened to Xbox and this is the name that was ultimately chosen. Now they had to come up with a controller. Microsoft contacted Sony's supplier on the controllers, Mitsumi Electric, to use a design similar to the PlayStation's folded circuit design that was compact. Unfortunately for Microsoft, Mitsumi was loyal to Sony and declined to work with Microsoft. They designed their own controller with a larger circuit board. This is the reason that the original controller was so large. Later, they developed a smaller, more compact design known as the Controller S. Now Microsoft just needed someone to manufacture the console for them. They contracted with Flextronics to produce the Xbox. They even built a new factory in Mexico for the production. Early production models were prone to failure, with about a 25% failure rate. This was corrected in later revisions. Gates himself leaked info about the project in an interview in 1999, stating he wanted the console to be the platform of choice for the best and most creative game developers in the world. In 2000, Gates was a keynote speaker at the Game Developers Conference and showed an early prototype of the system. Also during this time, Microsoft tried to acquire many different developers, such as Electronic Arts, Nintendo, Square Enix, and Midway without any success. But they were successful in acquiring Blessetha Game Studios, Tecmo, and Bungie which brought the first exclusive titles to the Xbox. The Elder Scrolls 3, Marrow Mine, Dead or Alive 3, and Halo. The Xbox was officially announced on January 3, 2001 at the Winter CES show, with Dwayne The Rock Johnson and Bill Gates unveiling it. The system was launched on November 15, 2001, with the first 1,000 units shipped to the Toys R Us store in Times Square, New York, with Bill Gates greeting people who bought it. Sales of the unit were initially strong, selling more than 1 million units in the first three weeks. Sales of the unit continued to be strong, selling more than 15 million units by July of 2004. However, things were not all good for Microsoft. Due to the high cost of manufacturing, they were losing money on every console they made. The initial sale price was $299, but the unit cost $425 each to make. Over the course of its lifespan, the console cost Microsoft over $4 billion in losses, but it was a good competitor to Sony and Nintendo. 
and with Microsoft's new exclusive titles being profitable, Gates ultimately decided to continue in the console market and start to develop the next generation, the Xbox 360. The Xbox 360 was announced on MTV in May of 2005 and released in November of the same year. Nvidia ceased production of the GPUs in August of 2005, the Xbox was discontinued in 2006. Although games were still being made for it until August of 2008 with Madden 09 being its last, Xbox Live support ended in April of 2010. The Xbox had a 5 year lifespan from 2001 until 2006, selling more than 24 million units and being Microsoft's first game console. Game over man, it's game over!